become a Cleveland firefighter, it takes a willingness to learn, strength, and agility. As these potential candidates to Cleveland's Fire Academy are finding out today as they participate in what's called the Firefighter Mile. So we're here doing the Firefighter Mile. Uh, this is a test that was developed by the collaborative effort between the Department of Public Safety, Civil Service, and the Cleveland Division of Fire to meet industry standards for agility tests for our firefighters. Currently, right now, fire applicants are in the process of taking this uh, uh, physical agility testing, uh, preparing and practicing for it so they can actually be tested in the next week or two. It's, it's an important test because the city is always working to improve our recruitment, evaluation, and training of firefighters and candidates to serve the citizens of Cleveland through the Division of Fire. Here the candidates will receive extensive training and they'll have an opportunity to practice to help them through the process uh, and succeed, which is what we want. Fire Chief Angela Cavillo and Safety Director Kerry Howard know exactly the type of candidate they are looking for. What I would want is an ideal candidate, is one that is willing to learn, be it a male, a female, uh, from a diverse background, because I think diversity, I believe diversity makes us a stronger division, uh, one that is teachable. Um, you know, it's great that you have formal education, but you can have just a high school diploma, but if you want to work and learn, uh, the physical agility part here we can train, the fire components we can train here at the Fire Academy. Uh, just being a good student of becoming a firefighter, that's what we're looking for. There's this misnomer that, uh, that women you know, can't be firefighters. We know that that's not true. Women can be firefighters, men can be firefighters, that we are not locked into this idea of, of, uh, of, of, of strength. You know, it's this idea of competency and, and, and leveraging uh, uh, your abilities to, in a way that benefits the Division of Fire and the, and the citizens, of, citizens of Cleveland. So we're looking for that diverse group, male, female, um, diversity and background, uh, ethnicity, race, to come and, and, and contribute to the Division of Fire because that diversity is what will make us stronger. Director Howard says the key to the future of Cleveland Fire is a strong recruitment program. We have to think long term, right? We want to have a sustainable recruitment effort that is always having qualified folks who have an interest and passion for helping and saving others um, to come to the Division of Fire. We want to feed that, that fire that they have um, for public service and, and give them a meaningful opportunity to grow uh, and to advance in, in, in a career field. And the Division of Fire accomplishes that. One thing that will never change at the Cleveland Division of Fire is the commitment of service to those in need. Some of their uh, most stressful times, we want them to be able to be sharp, we want them to be knowledgeable of their, of their field, and we want them to provide intelligent, competent uh, service to the citizens to make sure that uh, 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 safety, safety is first, because we're here to save lives. That's what our firefighters do. So the service of serving the people and providing safety as far as the Division of Fire, uh, you couldn't put a price on it. I love it, you love it, we all love serving the people. So when that call comes in for a house fire or a first responder, we're ready to roll to make a difference. When somebody's calling 911, it's the worst day of their life. And it's service to the people that keeps me inspired and rejuvenated every day. And I believe that's what we offer for these new members coming on. And once we get them in and actually show them you know, exactly what we do, uh, it's contagious. They love the job. They love the career. For more information on the City of Cleveland's Division of Fire Recruitment, call 216-664-6388 or visit city.cleveland.oh.us slash public safety careers.
Oh. So they can yeah. see, see your what? My bald spot. So what's your bald spot? It's, it's, it's where my hair grows, but it uh, looks like I'm bald. And, like, oh, where's that? Oh, okay. I didn't know you had it. It threw me off the mic. I know. Right, right. <laughs> I never noticed it. Yeah. Bishop. Here. Brandon Sellers. Conwell. Casey. Present. McCormick. Mooney. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, for housekeeping purposes, uh, we are going to do ordinance number 844 2021 last um, so that we, the other directors and other staff can get back to. Uh, back to business, because um, theirs will probably not be as time consuming. Um, so at this point, I'd like to begin with finance. Uh, Mr. Gentile, if we can begin. All right. Good afternoon. Hello there. I'm just, I'm just Beginning with inside voices, gentlemen. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Beginning with ordinance number 1025 2021 by Councilmember Kelly by departmental request and emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Finance on behalf of the Cleveland Municipal Court to enter into one or more contracts with Oriana House Inc. for professional services necessary to provide appropriate placement for defendants to be assigned into supervised pretrial release without the sanction of incarceration and to provide related services for the Cleveland Municipal Court for a period of one year with a one year option to renew exercisable by the Director of Finance. How are you doing? Yes, hey, to the chair, to the, to the council members. Uh, this is uh, the pre-trial pre release that, that the courts has. This, they've had this for several years. They have been using our Reno, Oriano House uh, for several years for this. Uh, they spent around $1.6 million on this, and the renewal is also $1.6 million. Okay, so um, we are going to be... The, this authorization is to contract with Oriana House for our for pretrial defendants who are not yet defendants, uh, to the but but referred by the Cleveland Division of Police. How does that work? Could you uh, to the to the to the uh, to the chair to the council? Yes, I mean, so they have to be referred to this to, to the Oriana House, um, right? Okay, so let me just read it again. Okay, so what we're contracting for 
is professional services, so these are generally drug and alcohol services, with Oriana House, <clears throat> placement of defendants to be assigned into supervised pretrial release without the sanction of incarceration and to provide related services for the court. So we are, the contract that we're entering into is for pretrial services that they will go to Oriana House as part of a pretrial process. Is that accurate? Right. To the chair, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and how, what is the value of this contract? So uh, to the chair, it's 1.6 $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. $1. million. million. And then it's also two. an option for 1.6 for the next year. Okay. And, and this pretrial release center has been open for how long? Uh, they've had it for, I think, at least to the chair, I think they have it for four to five years so far. Okay. And are we not participating? Is this a renewal of a contract? This, the, uh, the original, to the chair, the original contract is ending. So this is, we're getting a new contract, but it's with the same entity. Okay. Um, I, I happen to have been able to understand this. I've just, what I've, I'm familiar with this contract. I'm very familiar with Oriana House. But what, uh, what Jim said, does everybody understand what this is authorizing? Yep, just real quick, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, please. If, if I can understand what this contract is, just uh, for clarity, this is so that we could try to alleviate some of the overcrowding in the county jail right now. From the chair of the councilman, yes. So this is for the listening public and for everyone else. This is to try to find an alternative to incarceration at a pretrial division that we've been having this discussion um, in order to alleviate crowding at the uh, overcrowding crowding at the county jail for the last year or so, right? For, for the, to the chair, to the councilman, yes, that, that's okay. correct. Thank you. I'm comfortable with this, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Further questions, comments on 1025-2021? Yeah. Uh, councilman uh, Brian. Sure, through the chair. So without getting the exact cost, but this also alleviates the necessity to pay for the, them to be in the county jail, so it's a real allocation of resources too? From the chair to the councilman, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions on 1025-21? Hearing no further questions, ordinance number 1025-2021 stands approved. Ordinance number 1039-2021, by Council Member Kelly, by departmental request, an emergency ordinance authorizing Director of Finance to employ one or more professional consultants to assist in preparing for proposals to procure electricity and natural gas services for city facilities for up to two years or two one-year renewal options to employ energy suppliers and development firms to supply natural gas and electricity to city facilities and authorize one or more requirement contracts for the purchase of natural gas for related professional services and other agreements needed to implement this ordinance for a period of up to 10 years. Jason, how are you doing? Who wants this? Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. members of the uh, uh, committee. So this ordinance would effectively allow the city to do three things. Um, one, it would allow us to enter into a new contract for aggregated natural gas for all city facilities. It would allow us to enter into an aggregated uh, electric supply contract for um, all city facilities that are serviced by CEI. And that would also allow us to enter into a contract with an energy service consultant to help develop those RFPs and then do some ongoing um, energy management services and price monitoring for us. So this is pretty standard. We do this kind of every few years. The one difference in this contract would be looking at a potential longer term electric deal. Um, so instead of using that shorter term contract where we um, go to the market and try to find pricing that's based um, on rec renewable energy credits to meet our clean energy goals, um, a longer term contract we would look at could potentially allow us to help de derive and create some of this generation locally so we can keep some of those economic dollars and economic benefits here closer, home closer to home. Um, we would look at all of the options from a one year all the way up to the 10 year on the electric supply and allow the, uh, uh, well, candidly, the next administration when the RFPs to come back in to make that determination about the strategy they want to pursue. So why, um, the 10 years just strikes me as long. Um, what, what is different about this? And if you look at, um, you know, we've been in situations where the electric market was at a place where it made it seem like, uh, you yep. know, Prairie State was a good deal. Yeah. Um, like what, we don't want to be in that position. Um, so why, why up to 10 years? So Mr. Chairman, to the, to the members of the count, committee, um, as we've talked through this with our energy supply consultant, 10 years is about as short as we think we can go to create what we call additionality. Um, so there's To create what, I'm sorry? Additionality. So what we want to try to do um, right now when we buy it, go out to do clean energy, um, 
on these contracts, we're looking at backing them with renewable energy credits. So it's a little certificate that says this is coming from a clean source. Currently, when we do that, most of our renewable energy credits are coming from solar farms in Texas, um, or wind farms in Texas and Oklahoma, and a solar farm in New Mexico. What we'd like to do is use this contract and the city's collective purchasing power to try to drive more of that investment closer to home. Um, so when we see these long-term contracts like this, that's what we're trying to drive to. Um, the reason we think that this is probably a little bit different is when you look at market-based pricing, um, we can get pretty competitive and actually solar power in particular tends to be market competitive at the scale we would need to meet this. Um, so we would get a pretty reasonable price, but in order to secure that power and to create those, those generation assets, you need a little bit longer contract. Um, this is shorter than what we would see in terms of what we looked at with the on-site solar ordinance, which was a 25-year commitment. That's because we were building it really hyper-local. Um, this would get us probably within hopefully the region and the market, but we'd need to let the RFP process play out to determine that. But so then what would it look like? So if, um, if somebody were to um, put in a proposal for natural gas or, or electricity, would they be locking in a price for 10 years? Well, natural gas would probably be the shorter term contract. Um, right. just there, you don't want to lock your natural gas prices in quite that long. This is more, that longer term contract would be more focused on the electricity. So what we would ask vendors to do is basically bid on a series of options, right? So you can submit the short term contract where we're doing the yearly pricing and then exercising the options, which we're doing now. This is kind of the approach we've taken here um, for the, I guess probably for the past five, six, seven years um, to do that. They have an alternate bid option on that short-term contract where we would back it with renewable energy credits. But as we've gone through that process, what we've seen is the pricing on renewable energy credits is getting so high that it doesn't really make a lot of financial sense to pursue that, that method anymore. It becomes too expensive for what you're getting back in return. We would also ask them to bid on these longer-term options, whether it's a five-year option, whether it's a 10-year option as well, and then make the determination based on those bids, what's the best path forward for the city? Is it to continue on the path that we've been on where we buy these on the market-based contracts, or does it make financial sense and does it meet the broader policy goals of, um, of the city to look at these longer-term deals? And whose options are those? Uh, the options have historically, I think we've done three, two, three, one, and one. And um, there's so, the city's option? Yeah, we are. Well, yes, it's the city's option to exercise on those. So three, three, one. Tell three, three, one, and one, I believe. Okay. Three, three years and then one at council's discretion, one at the administration. Okay. Um, and I, councilman? What do you mean by three, three, and one? The option, length of the options. Yeah. No, it's an option that they would um, that they would submit an option to the city of Cleveland. The Cleveland have the option of picking up. And is that option three, meaning three years, or it means three years? Yes. Uh, the, the, so, Mr. Chairman, the councilman, um, it would be the initial term, and then it would be an annual option after that. So, on the shorter term pricing, I think what we do now is three years, and then a one-year option to renew at the council's discretion, and then a one-year option to renew at the administration's discretion. That well, but no, that's but that would be. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, to the councilman. Please. That would be for the kind of traditional approach that we've been taking for the past years. What we want to do is, is basically have a menu of options that the um, incoming administration could choose from um, to support clean energy goals if we need to. Uh, I think if we want to pursue a strategy that creates more economic activity here locally, we've got to start to think a little bit differently about some of the links of these contracts. Okay, and then for, for um, city facilities, that are within Cleveland Public Power's uh, footprint. Are they going to be contracted out, or is that just an assumption that Cleveland Public Power will continue to provide Mr. service to them? Mr. Chairman, to the, uh, the council and the committee, um, they're untouched by this ordinance. They're on a whole separate thing. There'll still be Cleveland Public Power um, supplied. This is only the city facilities. Um, this is, candidly, a lot of... Um, it's a lot of Cleveland water facilities in this that service out in, in the suburban communities. Right. Um, on the far, and some on the far west side in Ward 16. But to the extent that Cleveland Public Power is providing um, service to City Hall, um, that will remain. Uh, Mr. Like Chairman of the committee, not correct. Part of this. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, questions, comments on 1039, Councilman Brian Casey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, to either the chairman or the director. This was just introduced <clears throat> last Monday. Um, why didn't it go through utilities? Well, that's... This is the first... I mean, I read it mm -hmm. as an introduction last Monday, and then it's on finance today, and I'm just wondering why this wasn't routed through. I have some reservations myself. Mm -hmm. One with the 10-year the contract. I think our utilities, we've historically... 
When is the utilities next meeting? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Can you hear this tomorrow? I probably could. I'm meeting with Director we, Kane after this. Is anybody so. going to be harmed if this waits and if this goes through a committee hearing tomorrow and then comes back next Monday? Mr. Chairman, to the council, I think another week doesn't hurt us. Okay. So what I'd like to do is right. I would like to hold 1039-21 um, and push this to the uh, utilities calendar tomorrow, okay. and then we'll revisit this next Monday. Okay. All right. right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you, Jason. Okay, we are now going to go to ordinance number 103321, Councilmember Kelly by departmental request and emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by appropriating funds to the Department of Law for professional legal services for professional legal services contract or contracts to assist the city in matters related to the regulatory compliance and eligible use of funds under the American Rescue Plan Act to be encumbered during the period beginning March 3rd, 2021 and ending December 31, 2024. To the chair and the rest of the committee members, what we're asking is that we have uh, legal professional services. So before we dispense to any of the ARPA funds, uh, this, this outside firm who, who has been specializing nationally in, in different areas of the ARPA fund uh, will give us some advice to the eligibility of these projects. Because uh, we want to make sure, again, we do not, you know, overleap and uh, spend spend um, funds that aren't el on an, uh, an eligible project and have to pay it back. So um, we're asking that we get this extra legal counsel to uh, vet the eligibility of these programs. So you're, we're basically um, paying a law firm to check the eligibility before we allocate dollars to so that we can prevent any clawback down the road. From, to the chairman, yes, we want to just make sure that it's an eligible ex it's okay. an eligible expense before we make before that expense. Before we expend dollars, and then is there a is there a law firm that specializes in this? Is there a uh... Uh, to the chair to the council the, to the to the chair? Um, yeah, right. Uh, Bricker and Eckler Bricker? are the ones okay. that were you know using right now on a different, you know, a little bit of a different contract that we have. We had a little bit of discretionary money. They're looking at a couple of programs, but well, that's going to but they run out. So, okay. yeah, they understand. They've been doing this. They've been on a lot of the federal, um, uh, yeah, the federal. Councilman? Okay. Councilman, what, what's your point of information? Uh, what is the actual number? $191,000. Oh, no, no. Ordinance number 1033. 1033. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So basically, we're, we're, we are hiring a law firm for $191,000. Um, wait a sec. There's more. No, that's not right. That's right. 191, right? Correct. To the chair, that's correct. 191,000. Great. Uh, to make sure that we are within criteria before awarding any dollars. Uh, to the chair, that's correct. Thank you. Councilman Plenzik? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues, dear Mr. Gentile. So it's your opinion that our own law department can't do this for us? To the chair of the count, councilman, um, we're taking a look. We are taking a look internally. We have some, you know, finance people doing it. Law takes a brief look at this, and law is coordinating it. But uh, these are laws that are, these are uh, requirements that are changing. They're still not finalized, so we feel more comfortable with, a firm that's kind of more specializing than this type of uh, guidance. Okay, and then secondly, there, there's no local law firm that can do that. Uh, Bricker's to, local. Yeah, local. To the I thought they're based out of Columbus. Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati. There. The they have a local office uh, in Cleveland. Yeah. They have an Ohio presence, but they're yeah. they're sure. a, they're at the one Cleveland okay. center. Okay. I just I, I I keep asking myself on many occasions both at this table and, and not at this table, um, why do we have a law department, the effectiveness of our law department, as it pertains to so often we have to go out for outside counsel. And in the day, we very seldom went out for outside counsel because we had a law department we had confidence in. And um, I just want to, I want to pose that here at the table as we go, especially uh, the new counsel going into the budget rounds. Um, We've got, really have to have a, um, a, um, 
a law department that's going to be aggressive, is going to be leading the way, and one that we can, de we can depend on. And um, to have to go out for outside counsel repeatedly, repeatedly, is something that troubles me greatly. So if what I'm hearing is that this is something we have to do um, to be in compliance, then whether I, I, I might not like it, but I can live with it. But I, I just want to pose that to my colleagues, and I want to pose that to the administration as well. What, what do we got a law department for? We, we should have competent people down there who can advise this legislative body. Yes, we can do this, and no, we can't do that. And so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Further questions, comments on 1033, Councilman Brian Casey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm Chairman. sorry. Actually, you know what? Councilman Jones, okay. actually. No, no, I'll yield to Mr. Casey. All right, Mr. I got Chairman, you on the list. I just want to make sure I'm on. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman, to, to the, uh, your assistant, right? The assistant finance director? Uh, to the chair, of, I'm interim finance director. Oh, interim finance yeah. director. I'm yes, sorry sir. about that. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I mean, every ARPA hearing that we've had, or the majority of them, we've been told by the finance department what we can and what we can't do with these dollars. And now all of a sudden we need 191000 to go to outside council. And I have to agree with Councilman Polensic in, you know, our own law department and our finance department, you know, seem to be competent enough to get us to this point. It's just, I guess, they can't get us over the finish line. And I, I don't want to be wrong that. about any of this, though. I, mean, I, this I, I know, a, I get it. I get it. Because they mean, will clot back. Better, better, to, make a point. Yeah. better um, to be, to, yeah. Thank you. Council yeah. Brancatelli and then uh, Director. Uh, thank you. Just a quick point. Um, the um, $191,000 was in the original legislation that was introduced way back. Um, and it was always part, the complications of um, the complexity of the ARPA dollars of having review is um, significantly different than CDBG. And I think it was outlined previously that the rules are changing by the hour because maybe mm -hmm. by 1030 we're going to have another set of rulings. Um, so I think um, given how precise we need to be on $500 million, um, having there's two steps of verification. One is our legal interpretation. Another goes to the federal side where they have folks who will review what we have. So it, it is a, a, a tad more complicated. And so I, I think that's why it was carved out in original legislation. Um, so then if, if we hire this firm, which has already been selected allegedly, or it seems like it has been, and we get something wrong, does, and suppose the feds want a refund, right? Does that fall back on us because they've said it, because we got a law firm saying? I mean, how, how would that work out? I mean, does this give us cover as a city? Um, I'll let you take a shot. Mr. Have a Chairman, to the, to the get, interim director. Yeah. To, to the chair of the council. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the finance department has, you know, went through preliminarily and looked at all the programs, and that's, that's what we discussed when we came and said, we think you could do this, but you can't do this. Um, again, the, the uh, Councilman Bracatelli mentioned these things are changing. This is a very complex oh. federal grant probably more complex than any one that we've ever had. So we wanted to have extra cover from people that are really focusing on this sort of 24, they're, this branch or these attorneys are focusing on this, uh, this part of the, this grant. And uh, we want to really make sure that we don't misspend this and three or four or five years down the road, we don't get a finding for recovery. They don't have to come out of the general fund. So, uh, so we're, we're asking that we have this uh, extra cover through this uh, through a law firm that really is specializing in this new federal law. And one, one last question, Mr. Chairman, to the interim director then. In the contract that we'll sign with them, does it indicate that if the feds come back, we'll just say in four years or whatever, that we misspent, does it baked into the contract that they'll represent us as a city um, to the feds? Yeah. From the if it gets to that point? Yeah. To, to the chair of the council, I'll have to double check on that. Okay. Um, I believe it, it does, but I don't want to say for right. certain. Thank you, Mr. But Chair. I will get back with you on that. Thank you, Councilman Joe Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hate to say it, and I don't want to come back here and say I told you so years from now when, we, when we're talking about the opera funds. Uh, this council needs to have a, a real session where we have someone that can come in to explain to this council and to this body um, how these funds are supposed to be spent and their best uses is. And so, Mr. Chairman, that hasn't taken place like I would like to have seen it taking place. 
Um, and, but yet there still needs to be more time where we really, really fundamentally need to deliberate through this process. And we shouldn't rush the process, uh, especially, Mr. Chairman, given the fact that we have a new administration that is coming on to tenure here. And second, Mr. Chairman, to uh, the finance director as relates to the $191,000 that's going to be expended to an outside law firm, do we know who, Mr. Chairman, um, or have we had any discussions with Mr. Chairman to um, the assistant director on who that would be? Um, yes, Councilman. We, uh, director, why don't you? For, from the chair of the Councilman, yes, we're, we're looking at Bricker and Eckler to. I'm sorry, what was that? Bricker sorry. and Eckler is the uh, proposed It's called firm. Bricker, B U R K E R, or what? What are you saying? It's Bricker and Eckler. Bricker. Yeah, we'll get it to you, Councilman. And Atley or Eckler. Atley. We'll, we'll provide that Atworth. We'll get, we'll get you the. I know, I'm just getting it pronounced. I just want to write yeah. it down. Yeah. And, and so is, with this agreement, that covers, uh, what does it actually cover? To the chair of the Councilman, if we have proposed uses, we will send them to, to the firm. They would then look at those. They will look at the federal, the current federal guidance, and they'll they'll judge whether it's eligible or not eligible, or if partial par if it's partially eligible, and they'll give us reasons, and they'll also give us references to the federal regulations where it either is allowed or it's not allowed. Okay. So, so Mr. Chairman, to the assistant director, our director talked about. Um, Sharon Dumas talked about the fluidity of, of those changing processes, but also talked about what our allowable uses are. Um, one of the arguments that was settled, what, that was discussed here at the table, and this is a question that I would have to you, uh, can we use ARPA funds to hire personnel then, if we're hiring legal firms to decipher how we can use this, uh, can we also use those funds to hire personnel to, to strengthen up the city where it needs to be strengthened up at? For an example, more police on the street in the city of Cleveland. Director, do you know the answer to that question? If no, do you know the answer to the councilman's question? Yeah. For, for the chair to the councilman, I, I'm not sure. Uh, we'd, we'd have to look at that. Yeah. I mean, there are some personnel that are allowed. I don't know if it's new, but you're definitely reimbursed some of the ones that you have. Um, we would have to look at that. If you want an answer, we can, we can look into that and get that to you. I, I couldn't hear what you were saying because you're not speaking in the microphone. Okay. To the chair of the councilman, is it, can you hear this? I can hear you now. Okay, great. I said we can, I'm not positive on this, so I don't want to give you the, an incorrect answer. We can look into this and we can let you know, I mean, if you could hire police officers. But again, this grant is a three-year grant. At the end of the three years, there is no source to continue on employment. So we're not really look. we haven't really looked at full-time permanents that are going to be at the city Mr. ongoing. Mr. Chairman, I wasn't asking you to debate the issue. We talked so about the issue. what's your question? And, but since you put it out there, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to kind of like wound it up here for you. Not, what we, we were saying, Mr. One, Chairman, yeah. to the assistant director, if we did hire police on uh, in the city of Cleveland, for an example, we're about 200 police officers down. Uh, and if we use those ARPA funds or help to use those ARPA funds to, to add for any marketing or bringing on more police officers, because we have about 100 to 150 eligible police officers each year, that could always be a situation where it, it winds itself down, where we would not have to pay or incur any additional cost. And so that was talked about here at the table. But, Mr. Chairman, to the director, the whole point is, can we use those funds to hire personnel? And you're not sure. So, so let thank me, you, I Mr. Chairman. That was the question I had here as related to these funds. Okay, thank you. Is your question been answered? That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank he, you. He there are further questions, comments on 1033, Councilman Kerry McCormick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm going to vote yes on this. I just wanted to note, though, as we move on the next council and the next administration, I do think this highlights the need for us to think critically about investing in our law department as well as our government relations team Correct. to fulfill these types of services. So I'm a yes on this. I want to make sure we're doing this right. But I just want us to be thoughtful about how we invest in our law department moving forward. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councilman. Any further questions on 1033 2021? Seeing no questions, no further questions, comments, ordinance number 1033 2021 stands approved. Thank you, Director. Moving now to economic development.
Good afternoon, right. Director. Good afternoon. Starting with ordinance number 507 2021 by Council Members Bashir Jones, Brent Town and Kelly by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing Director of Economic Development to enter into a tax increment finance agreement with, agreement with Inspiring Group Limited or its designee to provide for the developer to make certain improvements to provide for payments to the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and to declare certain improvements to be real property to be a public to real property to be a public purpose. Director. Thank you. This uh, ordinance would authorize a 30-year non-school TIF uh, to support the redevelopment of 3101 Euclid Avenue. Uh, the development team is uh, Lemma Getachew. Um, it's a new developer working in the city. They're also working uh, on the project at 90th and Chester. Um, the building is a, almost 90,000 square foot, has been vacant for um, almost 20 years. It's next to the Channel 5 building on, uh, on Euclid Avenue. The conversion would be uh, 90 residential units, um, about a $26 million project cost because uh, state and, and federal historic tax credits um, as part of the project as well. Um, all of the community benefits, uh, Chapter 187, 188, um, Fannie Lewis law apply. Um, this project, uh, we came actually last year to get it started and then uh, it got put on hold because the developer uh, got COVID, but he, uh, he recovered, he's back at it and we're uh, happy to see it going forward. Um, the value of the TIF, uh, the non-school TIF portion, $137,000 a year, which is a present value of uh, just over $2 million. And this is, um, this is not, this is step two, that we're beyond chain of title, this is the second step to this? Correct. Thank you. Um, this ordinance, ordinance number 507, has been heard and recommended for passage by Committee on Development Planning Sustainability. Councilman and Chairman Tony Brancatelli, anything further on 507? Nothing further, fully supportive. Thank you. And the local council person is not here. I'm assuming he is supportive? Yes. Thank you. Questions, comments on ordinance number 507, 2020, 20, excuse Chairman. me, 2020. Councilman Brian Casey. Mr. Chairman, to the director, I just have one question. Who's the developer? His name is Lemma Getachew. He uh, is a, an immigrant um, a doctor, um, has purchased property and owned property throughout the um, region in, in 20 years, about 20 years, and is just getting started on development in the last couple of years. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Casey. Anything further on ordinance number 507-2020? Hearing none, ordinance number 507-2020 stands approved. <clears throat> ordinance number 768-2021. Council members McCormick, Brancatelli, and Kelly by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Economic Development to enter into a tax increments financing agreement <clears throat> excuse me, with Skyline Investments, Inc., or its designee to fund eligible project cost and project debt for the Hotel Cleveland project to be located at 24 Public Square to provide for payments to the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and to declare certain improvements to real property to be a public purpose. Director. Thank you. Um, Skyline Investments is a, a development company out of uh, Toronto um, that uh, invests in, in hotels on a national basis. They uh, purchased the Renaissance Hotel um, and have a plan to launch a uh, full renovation and, and, and rebranding of the hotel as the Hotel Cleveland, which is just part of the Marriott uh, flags, um, would lead to 166 jobs at the, at the hotel. Um, the total investment is uh, about $56 million. Um, it's a, we're talking about a 30-year non-school TIF here. Um, the value is uh, about $300,000. Uh, a year, uh, present value of about three and a half million dollars in total uh, contribution to the project. Uh, the remaining of the funding will all be by the uh, investment company itself, so over uh, 50 million dollars of cash put into, um, put into the project. So uh, again, all of our uh, community benefits apply, uh, Chapter 187, Fannie Lewis Law, Workforce Development Agreement. Uh, excited to see this, this uh, moving forward, and, and this is a major um, event space uh, that really was in need of a refresh and will, will really help with uh, tourism and events downtown. Thank you, and again, this is, uh, this is not chain of title, this is step two Correct. of the process, is the actual agreement. Um, and this has been heard and recommended for passage in previous committee by Development Planning Sustainability. Uh, Chairman Brancatelli, on 768, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm fully supportive. Um, a wonderful opportunity to reinvest in a grand hotel. 
Thank you. And this real estate lands in Ward 3. Councilman Kerry McCormick, are you supportive of 768-2021? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman. I've had the opportunity um, with the director and their development team to review this thoroughly, as well as reviewing it through our committee process at DPS uh, and support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Any further questions, comments on 768-2021? Mr. Chairman. Councilman. I did the, for this particular piece, um, we don't have, do we have at any point in time um, the organization or the investment team come to the table and talk to us about it? Or is just, this has all been handled by the administration? It's all been handled by the administration. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Anything further on 768 2021? Seeing nothing, ordinance number 768 2021 stands approved. Wait, let me sign it. And the owners. Where's that? Hotel, Hotel Cleveland? <laughs> Jeez, man, you let ordinance number 919 2021. Council members Griffin, Brank, Kelly, and Kelly. By department, of di by department of request, an emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Economic Development to enter into a tax increment financing agreement with Fairmount Properties LLC or its designee to provide for the development of a mixed-use project located at East 105th and Cedar Avenue to provide payments to the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and to declare certain improvements to real property to be a public improvement. Director? Thank you. Again, this is the, the second ordinance uh, necessary to authorize a non-school TIF in support of the uh, mixed-use project uh, located at 105th Street in Chester to be developed by Fairman Properties, um, which is a uh, local investment firm um, that owns retail centers throughout the area and throughout the country. Uh, the project will include a 40,000 square foot Meyer uh, grocery store, uh, in addition, um, 250 uh, residential units, um, and the development of parking uh, will create approximately 40 jobs at the site, as well as bring uh, grocery opportunities to that area as well. This has been a long, uh, a long time coming on this project, and we're happy to see it moving forward. Um, the estimated value on the TIF, uh, once it uh, Kicks in is about three hundred and fifteen thousand uh, dollars net present value on the piece, uh, two point three six million. Um, so, uh, again, long time working together on this project. Really excited. It's coming forward. Great, thank you. And this is located in Ward Six. I'd like to hear from the local council person, Councilman Blaine Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Strongly support this piece of legislation. Ask my colleagues to support it. A lot of work, a lot of due diligence. Probably been about four to five years that we spent vetting this deal. Um, so now we're at the point to really put a shovel on the ground. And this has been well thought out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Kevin Conwell. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. To uh, <coughs> Councilmember Blaine Griffin, this project is on 105th in Chester, right across the street uh, from my ward. Is that correct? 105th in Cedar. 105th, no, 105th in Cedar. Yeah. Meyer. I would like to have, uh, matter of fact, a few meetings in my ward with Fenway Manor and Justin Manor because they've been asking questions about it. They're excited that it's coming, but they don't know the, um, the particulars. All right, so I'll get together with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Brian Mooney, then Councilman Karen McCormick. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question, question in reading this. Um, maybe you could explain what is a micro plus unit or a standard micro unit talks about 90 micro plus units and six standard micro units. What does that mean? Sure. So if, if you're looking at uh, apartments, you know, generally you start at studio, um, one bedroom, two bedroom as you're getting bigger and bigger. Micro units is a, a new model um, in this market that's been uh, successful in um, a lot of like New York and, and Chicago and so the hotter, mar hotter markets that is essentially a very small studio, hence um, well. my, it's a very small studio style apartment, so all in one area. And it's really designed for um, uh, appeal towards students, um, it's medical, like in this, this project is designed really to appeal to medical students and uh, workforce at the Cleveland Clinic. And the kind of people, um, you know, you see more and more a growing trend uh, in that population, people whose home is basically where they have their bed and they do everything else outside of the house. And so that you can get a very small unit for a reasonable price in a great location that meets your needs. And so it's, it's adding diversity to our housing in that area. And so we think it's a good thing. Okay, so it's, it's smaller than a one bedroom. Yes. And then what's the difference between 
a micro plus unit or a standard micro unit? Uh, it's square footage. It one, I, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. One's a little one's, bigger, you know, one's maybe a little two smaller. or 300 square foot, and the next is maybe four. But they're both smaller than a one bedroom. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman uh, Pointer, and Councilman Just McCormick a very first. quick on that point. And then Councilman McCormick. Sure. Um, just very quick on that point. I would really encourage and um, invite any of my colleagues to come and look at the micro units. It's a new, um, if you've ever been to Europe, they are very popular in Europe. But uh, these are basically designed so that executives, students, and others can almost just plug and play into a, an apartment. So you don't have to bring your own furniture, everything. When you have the micro plus units, all of the details, all of your bed, everything from the TV and as well are already furnished and already um, put into a concept that all you literally have to do is bring your suitcase in. I know that Councilman Conwell has some in his area. Um, I have a couple um, that are being developed in my area, but it's actually a new concept that probably all of my colleagues across the city will start to see uh, because um, a lot of people just want something more efficient. So it's just a fancy efficiency to make a long story short. Thank you. <laughs> Council McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief, but as I did in DPS, I just wanted to speak in support of this project. This is a really exciting project for the neighborhood, not in Ward 3, of course, but just the combination of the housing with the grocery store and the community, I think, is just a really positive thing. So I wanted to just speak out in support of this legislation. Thank you, Councilman. Anything further on 919-2021? Hearing none, ordinance number 919-2021 stands approved. Ordinance number 985-2021, Council members Conwell, Brancatelli, and Kelly by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing, uh, authorizing Director of Economic Development to enter into a grant agreement with Glen Village LLC or its designee to provide economic development assistance to partially assist with generally, general operating expenses of the Glen Village Incubator at Glenville Circle North. Director? Yeah, this is uh, support for the Glen Village Incubator that's uh, operated at uh, Glenville Circle North at East 105th Street, Nashbury. Um, the Glen Village Inc Incubator is part of the Neighborhood <coughs> Transformation Initiative designed to support uh, entrepreneurship. Um, when we, we worked on this, we had the great pleasure of opening up a uh, retail center in January of 2020, um, so it didn't quite work out as planned over the last couple of years, um, but really it's been, um, I would say, a, a, a success in a different way than we anticipated. Um, we had seven initial tenants, uh, five of whom are still in the, in the space and operating today um, and working forward, uh, and, and we've brought in uh, two more replacements real quick, despite some of the challenges that you'd expect to see in, in uh, entrepreneurship and, and retail space. Um, this project will help, uh, again, to, to subsidize some of the operational costs. Um, the anticipation was that rent would support a greater portion of the cost than it did, but um, obviously with the pandemic going on, made the decision to keep the rents low, and so that's why this grant is, is pretty much the same as what we had asked for as part of the initial startup phase. Um, this will cover the next two years, 2022 and 2023, um, and hopefully allow us to uh, get this back on track, um, get these entrepreneurs rotated out into a larger development space and bring in a, a next group um, within that window as we originally anticipated. So it's been, been a great project, been a great experience. Um, I think it's a great asset for the community and the city um, and would uh, request support. Thank you. And this is a, this is a great project that uh, if you haven't been out there, I encourage everybody to take a drive by 105th and Ashbury. It's just a uh, it's a, it's a great development. It's, it's beautiful, and the pandemic made the retail component challenging. But it's uh, there's certainly um, other options with this great space. So I'm happy to see this move forward. This has been heard and recommended for passage by Committee on Development, Planning, and Sustainability. Uh, Chairman Brackettel, anything further on 985? Nothing further. Full, fully supportive in committee. Great. And this uh, great project happens to be in Ward 9, and I'd like to hear from the local councilperson, Councilman Kevin Conwell, on Glen Village. I just need help from the director to change from black box fix to um, Zanzibar. That's number one. And number two, it's a great gathering place in the Glenville community. We're growing businesses, and it's three new businesses that, have, um, that came into um, Glen Village um, incubator. Um, they're hiring people from the community that's working there. So I see people walking to work, to and from work. And we had a big event this weekend when we, um, Glen Village, the businesses there gave out more than 500 turkeys 
in the community to residents in the neighborhood. So um, I ask my colleagues to support this. It's a great project. We're growing businesses. And I, and I need your support. Thank you very much. And don't forget to change that name to the, okay. <laughs> to the director. Well, I think Time we just signed the lease a couple weeks ago, so we're, we'll get on it for okay, sure. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Councilman Kindwell, thank you very much. This is a great project, and thanks for all your work to uh, bring this to uh, bring this to fruition. Further questions, comments on ordinance number 985-2021. Hearing none, ordinance number 985-2021 stands approved. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Uh, we are now going to move to the main event, uh, ordinance number 844-2021. If people could join us at the table for this, please. Director, Director Ebersol. Okay, welcome. Welcome back, I should say. Okay, uh, we're here. We're going to, um, this is the next hearing for ordinance number 844-2021. What I'd like to do is I'm going to read the ordinance. Um, just, a, just a couple opening remarks. I'd like you to go through your presentation. Um, and then I'll ask for responses to questions that were raised during DPS. And then we'll move to general questions. Okay, so I'm going to let me read ordinance number 844-2021 by Councilmember Kelly by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the execution of a cooperative agreement with Cuyahoga County, Gateway Economic Development Corporation of Greater Cleveland, and or the Cleveland Indians Baseball Company, LLC, relating to financing, operations, repair, upkeep, and construction of appropriate modernizations of Progressive Field, and authorizing contribution of city funding is the... First off, my first question, do we need to amend the Indians portion of the caption, or is it um, elsewhere? To the is it otherwise corrected in the legislation? To the to the to the chair, we yes. do have a couple amendments, and I think it it goes to that. Okay. I'll give you a sheet, and I can um, read them. I okay. Yeah, if I could please have those. Why don't we have I've got the term here. sheet in here. Don't I don't have any those? amendments. No, here here's the amendments. All right. All right. So here is uh, suggested amendments. Information was asked right now. In line six. In the title line, Mr. line Chairman. six, after LLC, insert or successor, meaning the Cleveland Indians or successor. In right, the second whereas this clause, line two, after LLC, insert through its successor. In the sixth whereas clause, line two, after approved by insert gateway. In section four, line two, after city council, insert pursuant to the term sheet. Um, my only question on these amendments, and this would be for uh, Director of Law, Kevin uh, Roberts. Um, when you say successor, it, are the Guardians the successor to the Indians, or is it just a rename, not successor? That, that, that doesn't seem like successor. Successor seems like, and I could be wrong, that's why I'm asking the question. Mr. Chair. Yes. I, I think I, I'll defer to um, our, the organization who is at the table. Uh -huh. um, and. As Mr. Gentile provided you, we were we were provided these um, suggested or requested amendments um, at the request of the Cleveland Guardians Baseball Club. So, um, well, I guess my question then, Kevin, would be this: Is successor the appropriate term? If we're wanting to encompass mm -hmm. Indians, Cleveland Indians, now they will be named the Guardians. It, are they are the Guardians a successor? To the Indians, is that the proper term? Is what I want to make sure we get this right. It, it is a, it is a proper term okay. for the transition. Okay, successor is a proper term. It, it certainly is. But again, let, let's defer to our. Um, okay. The, the I just want to make sure we get this right. Yep. Just define Absolutely. the meeting, Mr. Chairman. Just put the name in. Put the Did meeting you? in place in writing, just in case our attorney doesn't know. Thank, you. Joe. To the chair, mm -hmm. the. We did amend the name. Right. So it technically is an amendment. Uh, okay. And it's the same entity, not a successor entity. Right. Okay. Like, that, that was my. Like somebody by merger or somebody by. Yes. You know, some other form of acquisition. Right. It's, so it's the same entity. 
it's just the name is yeah changed. so it's not a successor right so, so if what i if, were recommending i would say maybe change it to guardians so what if we just said strike is it is it appropriate at this point um, uh, on November 22nd, 2021, to strike Cleveland Indians Baseball Company and put Cleveland Guardians Baseball Company? To the chair, that is correct. All right. Did you, so, Kevin, wh how we're going to amend it is instead of successor, we're going to strike Indians and replace with Guardians. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, if, if we can have a motion to yeah, well, I need you. Thing. you I want to make sure you understand it first. Yeah. Okay. Um, as a chair, I can't make a motion. I'll make. I will make a motion, but if we could, I want to make a point of clarification. Okay. So let let me get a second, then we'll have discussion. Sure. Is there a second? Chairman, there's a second to the second. motion. Second. Discussion, Councilman Blaine Griffin. So just as successor, I know that any subsequent owner would also be subject to the agreement that we pass. So should we or do we have to keep successor in there in addition to um, striking the Cleveland Indians and putting the Cleveland Guardians? Or is that inherent in or any is that transfer, inherent in any transfer of any? the agreement? No. Ken? Through the chair to Councilman Griffin, uh, the, the, the authorization you give here will be for a lease with the Cleveland Guardians. That lease, as the present lease, will be uh, any subsequent owner of the team will take subject to the lease, which will have all the terms that we are discussing today. You don't need to call out and successors in, in your ordinance. In it will ordinance. happen by operation of the lease. Appar okay. okay. As long as um, we are clear on our end on that side, I'm good. So mm -hmm. I'll stick with the motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion, Councilman? Is this motion just for the, the successor, just for one, or just is it for all of it, them? Just to change where it says Indians to Guardians. Okay. So it's not all of these amendments. It's no, just it's that just one. that one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further. Further questions? Do you have a uh, Councilman Kevin Kinnell? No. Okay. Point. Okay. okay. You're good. Okay. Uh, further questions? Um, is there any objection to the motion, or excuse me, to the amendment? Uh, can I get approval without without objection? Without objection. Okay. Thank you. So we're good, Kevin. Okay. Okay. Now we got that done. Um, okay. So that is the ordinance that is in front of us. Um, we. This has had a. Uh, we were all, not all of us, most of us were at the hearing at uh, Development Planning Sustainability. And if I were to like tell you some, some broad takeaways, um, it seemed that the, the yes, no question of whether this is important to the future of the city of Cleveland, um, whether it's important for economic development has been answered. And now it's, it's down to kind of the, the details of the, of the term sheet and what that looks like and, and pr making sure that the general fund is, is appropriately, um, you know, pr you know has guardrails around it. Is that a, a good summary, Councilman Brancatelli, as the chair of that committee? Okay, so with that, I would like to ask you to do the presentation that's on, that's on our um, tablets. Mr. Mr. Councilman. Chairman, can I just get a point of clarification? Yes, please. On the amendments? Yes. If we have, can we have a discussion on one of the other amendments? Yes, Does you know what, I'm glad accessory? you brought that up. As a matter of fact, we should probably have motions for all of these, so I'm glad all you right. brought that up. Um, can I get a motion to accept um, the amendment two, three, and four, and I'm going to read them again. And the second whereas clause line two after LLC insert through its, um, well, there's that successor thing again. Uh, <laughs> um, so how, however that would read, through the guardians. Um, and the sixth whereas clause line two after approved by insert gateway in section four line two after city council insert pursuant to the term sheet. Um, so I would like to get a motion to accept these in a second, then we'll have discussion. Is there a motion for the amendments? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion, Councilman Brian Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and the fourth amendment in section four, um, or section four reads, purchase of Gateway East Garage. No purchase of the Eastway of the Gateway East Garage shall be permitted unless authorized by city council. Uh, and the same rights to the spaces in the garage afforded by the parking facilities agreement as amended shall continue following said purchase by the team. To me, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, that reads that the guardian organization has to come back before city council um, in order to approve 
approve a potential sale of the Eastway garage if they so enact that um, clause in the term agreement. The way that they're, the, with the amendment that they're using um, that they want to put in there is um, after city council insert pursuant to the term sheet, which would automatically kick in the sale of the garage as opposed to, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the way I'm reading it, and I'm not an attorney, I'm just reading it as a good lay person, um, that the, the way that the amendment reads is that in the term agreement, it just says that they, the guardians have the um, right to purchase the garage within two years. In the legislation, it says that they have to come back before the council uh, in order to to kick that clause in, because the way it reads now is that unless authorized by Cleveland City Council, the way the amendment reads is that it, it just kicks back to the term sheet. So the term sheet and what the legislation say are actually two different things, if I'm if I'm reading it correctly. So I guess okay. what I would say is that it doesn't strike the requirement of council authorization. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have somebody check my, my legal math on this. Okay. But it says, um, authorized by council pursuant to term sheet, meaning that council can't like wildly change the terms on right. the authorization. I just want to make sure that. Is that accurate? Just make sure I'm right first. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Finance Committee and other council members. Uh, for the viewing audience, my name is Ken Silliman. I'm chairman of the Gateway Economic Development Corporation of Greater Cleveland. On the uh, question at hand, uh, my view of it, and I would also defer to uh, legal counsel on this, but my reading of it is analogous to yours, and that is that the term sheet gives the team the option to purchase the garage for $25 million within two years of this uh, council authorization. Uh, however, the, the council legislation itself provides that that purchase at that time must be specifically authorized by council. The way I read the two together is that if the team decides sometime in the next two years that they wish to exercise their option to purchase the garage for $25 million, they can do so, and that will go to city council. Uh, however, neither the team nor council would be in a negotiation on price. That's where the term sheet comes in. The term sheet sets the price, but as to this specific closing transaction itself, it must go to city council. And again, I would defer to the law department on my reading of that. Okay. Councilman Casey? I think we refer to the law department, did right? I, I said earlier, I'm no attorney. Yeah. I just want to make sure that yeah. if the guardians opt to purchase the garage within two years. And the Guardian's you know, legal representation is here as well. According to either the term sheet or the legislation, will they have to come back in front of city council to get the okay for the purchase? Or do they just have to come back in front of us and tell us that they're purchasing the garage? I mean, I know that there's no negotiation on the price, mm -hmm. right? The price is set in the terms, but is there, is there room for this council to say in the future either no, we're not selling you the garage, or yes, go ahead and purchase the garage? So, Kevin, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, um, Mr. Chair, uh, to Councilman Casey, the amendment does not, on its face, does not change the requirement that that purchase would have to be authorized by city council. It and. The, the terms of in section four is unless authorized by city council. That remains. Now, I don't have the term sheet here unless it says that it is a matter in which um, is fully authorized other than, you know, the, the, the price itself. If you have an issue with, with that term, that's a different matter. Well, otherwise, the, the 
baseball club will be returning to city council. Right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think the ultimate question is, does the council have the ability to tell the guardians if they choose to opt to purchase the garage? Because I, I, it says two different things in the terms in the legislation. There's two different things there. So does the city council, to whomever can answer it, I don't, you know, whoever, does the council have the ability, if the guardians kick that option of the term sheet in, to tell them, no, we're not selling you the garage? And maybe the, 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 the guardians legal, Josie, maybe, I, don't, I just can't, I can't pronounce your last name, so. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Wait, let me, let me ask him answer, answer the question, then we'll go to your councilman. Did you? Joe. Uh, the, the way I would read it is, is somewhat similar to Ken's. Uh, the idea that the price can be a different price is fixed, but I think if anybody's ever gone through a real estate transaction, they know that there's normally a real estate purchase agreement. It normally deals with things like simple things like tax prorations and closing costs and the like, and those things would have to be determined and negotiated and finalized by this council in order to permit the transaction to go forward. Uh, and I suppose if, if, you know, to state it the other way around, if, if, if we were to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, can a distinguished gentleman please speak in the mic so I can hear him? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If we were to... Can you hear me? Yes, I can Thank hear you. Thank you. I'm sorry. The, if, 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 assuming that all other terms and conditions can be met but for the price of $25 million, then I would assume that this would be a given deal. Okay, so I will, in the, uh, a absent anything else, if you look at the plain text of the ordinance, it says, no purchase of Gateway East Garage shall be permitted unless authorized by the city council. Pursuant to the term sheets. But sure. the term sheets say that they have the ability to just buy it without coming back before the council. Correct? Well, the, I don't believe so. All right, I think, I okay, don't believe so. I think the, the simple, I think, Maybe I'm just looking for a yes or no. Do they have to come back, and do we have the ability to tell them no? Yes and yes is my understanding. Does anybody right. disagree with that? But Mr. Chairman. One second, Calvin. I promise I hear you. I promise. Okay. Um, does anybody disagree with, with that answer to the councilman's questions, which are yes and yes? No. Hearing no disagreement. Mr. Chairman. Here, councilman, okay. I will recognize you after we get through this, uh, this question. I promise. Is everybody, are we all on the same page? Mr. Chairman. Let me, I have to hear uh, from Ward 1 first, and then I'll promise I'll come to you as well. Councilman Joe Jones. Mr. Chairman, we are grossly underrepresented at this table. And um, for starters, what I mean by that is who was the attorney that deliberated this agreement um, on behalf of the administration? And why isn't he here? And why don't we have the director of finance here at this table to talk about these terms? Now, one time have we sat at these meetings and had the, the, the main people that should be sitting here discussing this issue before council that could, act, that could uh, answer the questions that this council has put forth. And this council has asked a number of questions on a four-hour deliberation uh, last week, and I don't have any of that information in front of me. I have an attorney at the other end of the table who did not not have the, the, the sheet in front of him. And so, Mr. Chairman, the question would be, we need to probably sit back, get the attorneys from across the hall that deliberated this, this concept and really start to dig in into it. And Mr. Chairman, I would be super unready, and I think this table is unready from at least talking to some of my colleagues about passing this deal and not really having uh, all the information before our, our fingertips here today. So my question, Mr. Chairman, is why don't we have the finance director sitting here at this table who is very competent and capable, and why don't we have the person who negotiated this with the city uh, as our legal counsel sitting at this table to explain to us these terms that we're grappling here at the table right now? And believe me, there's more. The finance director is with us. Uh, Mr. Gentile is the interim finance director. Um, in well, I'm talking about the director, Dumas. Why well, isn't she, she here? And why, so, and why isn't uh, we, we have the legal team that negotiated with the Cleveland Indians sitting here at this table to help this council 
uh, move do, through this direction yeah. on this whole proposition. And it's going to be a long-term proposition of at least 15 years. I would like, Mr. Chairman, to be a 30-year deal versus a 15-year deal. So at the end of the day, um, we need to have the, the experts who negotiated this agreement sitting here at this table explaining to this council why they came to this agreement. Okay. Uh, I don't have the answer to those, Councilman, so I will. So we should hold the legislation until right. we bring them to the table? Okay, That's I disagree. I it. appreciate your opinion. They, they need to be sitting here at the table. This deal we make here, if we pass this legislation, we're held accountable to this piece. Um, and it, it, um, it's like a shackle on you. And we need to really start to deliberate in some of these finer points. And, Mr. Chairman, we don't have it here at this table right now. I don't see that capacity okay. sitting here. Okay. I see us uh, sitting here Did asking the other side about how they feel about all this, but our side negotiated this. They should be sitting here at this table. This is a serious issue. Director, did you want it to impacts respond? the entire yeah. city of Cleveland for the next 15 years. Director. To the chair of the councilman, you know, these are the people, I mean, I, were in some of the nego I was in some of the negotiations with, with the Guardian slash Indians. Uh, Chief Dumas was in some of those as well. We kept each other up to date. You know, law was briefed on this. Um, and they've read the agreement, and the actual the, the term sheet and the agreement have been looked at extensively by the administration, uh, as well as the team at the table and the Ask rest them. of the team that will be presenting for the guardians on this. Just, Mr. Oh, I just had a point of information. I have Councilman Conwell, and then I'll come to you, Councilman. Just uh, a point Councilman Conwell. You know what, uh, in respect to you, Mr. President. You weren't clear when you say yes and yes. That means what to me? Okay. Yes and yes. I mean, sure. Do they have to come back to the table to yes. purchase the the um, the garage? Yes. Okay. That's that's what I needed to know. The yes and yes. That means yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me go to Councilman Plenzik and then back to Councilman uh, Mooney. It, it was just a point of information, Mr. Okay. okay. I thought you were. I thought you had concluded. Which question is that, Councilman? Can't hear you. Mr. Chairman, the question is not clear before the council as it relates to the $25 million. Uh, and what I mean by that, if Cleveland City Council opts to say, no, we don't want to sell our asset that makes us money uh, here in the city of Cleveland that helps to pay for all of uh, the things that we need to pay for, um, will that be a, a deal killer? Will the, the Indians say, okay, that's a bad deal, we're out of this? So the question is, Mr. Chairman, directly to the Indians, uh, would that be a deal killer uh, if this council does not want to sell its parking garage as a part of this deal? Uh, if anybody wants to answer that question. I think to the uh, councilman, to the chair, the, uh, I think the optionality to the club is very important. The uh, idea that there is uh, both difficulty and opportunity potentially relative to the garage is something that we've looked at in depth. Um, I'm not going to kid you. The consultant that uh, we hired to evaluate the garage evaluated it considerably less than what this particular uh, option price is, and that's going to be a rather difficult hill for us to climb going forward. Uh, but the idea that we would like to get control of the garage and operate it in the overall best interest of the team and also the, uh, our neighbors, the Cavs, is something that is, is uh, uh, very attractive to us and a very integral, integral part of the deal. So, so, Mr. Chairman, the, and I know I, I get what you're saying, so it pr pretty, I would presume that it would be a, a deal killer based upon what you just stated. And then, Mr. Chairman, to uh, our finance director, why don't we have any of that information in front of us that talks about um, what are the projections of the cost? Why hasn't that been deliberated to the council? There's a lot of information, Mr. President, uh, to uh, the, the assistant director of finance that this council does not have in front of it. And Mr. Chairman, quite frankly, uh, Mr. President, we just received this on October 4th, according to this legislation. I know we talked about it and deliberated on a couple of occasions here on this table. 
but we don't have all the information that we need to have. And so that, that puts this council who represents the citizens of the city of Cleveland at a disadvantage. We, we don't have the director of finance sitting at the table, and we don't have um, uh, the, the, the law department sitting here neither at the table, nor do we have any consultants to direct this council as if this deal is a good deal for uh, the citizens of the city of Cleveland, or is it a good deal based upon the climate, because I know that we're going to start talking about that here in a moment in terms of uh, um, cities and baseball uh, operations and, and sports franchise teams and those kinds of things. But Mr. Chairman, sitting here at this end of the table, and I appreciate your leadership, we certainly would love to have uh, you know, our folk who have been a part of deliberating this, and if the assistant director has been a part of that, then it would be good to, to see what those actual projections are. And we haven't gotten any projections of the club uh, in terms of the finances, how healthy the, the Cleveland Indians have have been over the space of time. Uh, we have none of that information in front of us, uh, nor do we have, we do have in front of us this memorandum of understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, by which we don't even have any accountability of that understanding as relates to the agreement that was struck uh, in 2014, I believe it says is on this memorandum. So what are the outcomes of that? And then how does that compare to where we are right now for any kind of future agreement? And, and I could just go on, but I don't want to, to belabor that point, Mr. Chairman. I just, I think that the Indians have made it clear that this $25 million is important to them uh, in terms of being able to purchase the, this garage, and this is all full throttled a part of this, this, this agreement here. So this council certainly needs to maybe step back a couple of steps because we've only got this information in front of us as of October the 4th, and we need more time to deliberate. And we have a lot of questions that was answered in a four-hour deliberation with uh, Chairman Anthony Bracatelli, of which I have not received any of those answers to any of those questions uh, that was set here at this table uh, as I looked through it and deliberated through that four-hour process. Mr. Chairman, I yield the floor. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman uh, Plenzik? Mr. Chairman, I just had a point of information, and you can put me yes, on a little. I just I wasn't clear on who actually negotiated. I heard Mr. Gentile, but I wasn't clear who else negotiated on behalf of the city. From the Go chair ahead. to the councilman, I was involved in negotiations. Chief Dumas was. Uh, the law department at times was involved. Gateway was involved. The Cleveland Guardians were involved. Uh, the, uh, the Cleveland Partnership, the Greater Cleveland Partnership at some point was involved. Who were, they were negotiating on behalf of the city? To the, the chair partnership? of the council. No, no, they weren't negotiating on part of the city. It's a deal with the county, the city. I'm, so, I'm sorry, and the county was involved. The city was looking at what at the terms for the city, just like we're looking at those, you know, we're looking at those now. Uh, it's a deal for the county, the city, Gateway, and the Cleveland Guardian. So all those parties were involved in the negotiation, um, you know, but the city of Cleveland people were looking at what was best for the city. And Mr. Chairman, again, who was from the law department representing us? From the chair to the, the, from the, chair to the councilman, there was nobody at all the meetings for law uh, that were with the city of Cleveland at the time. But this is a legal agreement. There, you're telling me there was nobody at the, at the, at the meetings all the time from the law department? From the chair of the council, we brief law. Chief Dumas and I brief law on an ongoing basis. Thank and they've you. read and, and to, to the to the councilman through the chair, they have read this. You know, they, they looked at the amendments that we sent. So they, they they're they're aware of the agreement. They vetted the agreement. Uh, they support the agreement. Okay. Well, all I know, Mr. Chairman, when they say Mr. Gentile says they, I'd like to know who they is. So I'll leave it at that point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilman Brian Mooney. Um, thank you. Just to piggyback on what uh, my honorable colleague, Mr. Palencic, said. So, just make sure I understand this right. Um, Mr. Silliman was there representing Gateway. Yeah, and of course, you had Indians representatives. You and Ms. Dumas were there on behalf of finance. And you're saying there weren't members of the law department at these meetings? The chair of the councilman. Not in the meetings that I attended. Excuse were, me? From the chair of the councilman, not at the meetings that I was physically at. How many meetings were you physically at? From the chair of the councilman, probably about seven or eight. 
So we had no legal representation from the chair at of the those meetings? From the chair of the councilman, we briefed, we, we briefed the law department every step of the way. They did get it. They did get the agreement. Right. Um, and they were, the law director was briefed on an ongoing basis. But, they, but nobody from our law department was pres present at any of these negotiations. So, so who was given? So, did, so it was up to you and Ms. Dumas to do any negotiations on behalf of the city? I'm sure the councilman, I mean, we negotiated the deal. We would bring it back. We would talk to law. We would talk to the, to the administration. On the terms, we went back and forth, negotiated. It was a long process. Who, who gave you your parameters to negotiate? Well, we met with, I mean, Chief Dumas and the mayor uh, and the law director, that's who we met with. Excuse me? To the chair of the councilman, the mayor, uh, Chief Dumas, the law director, and I was involved with, with negotiating. Okay, but, but they just had you and Sharon Dumas, the, the chief director, you were the two individuals who negotiated on the behalf of the city at these meetings. To, to the chair, to the, to the councilman, I was present at, at several of the meetings. Chief Dumas was present. The ones that I was physically at, I was physically at for the city. And yes, the law, law department was not physically at those meetings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get to the presentation, then we'll come back to questions. Um, if we can... Go through. The presentation is on our tablets. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I'm, thank you. Thank you. Um, any further discussion on the amendments? Thanks for bringing that up, Councilman. <laughs> I'm going to leave that hanging. If so, let's, well, then we'll... I don't agree. Um, I'd like to take a vote on the amendments. Uh, it's been seconded. It's been mo moved and seconded. Um, is there objection other than Councilman Jones? Yes. Okay. Call the roll, please. Yeah. Yes. Griffin. Yes. No. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a no at this point. We've got to answer yeah, no, the no, no, I was right. we, we had a... No. Yes. Yes. Six days, two days. Thank you. Uh, the amendments... Uh, pass with the um, <laughs> the change in number one where instead of success will be guardian. So if we could be, go back to the presentation, if we can, which is on our tablets, and then we'll have further questions after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I indicated previously, I rep my name's Ken Silliman. I represent the Gateway Economic Development Corporation of Greater Cleveland. Gateway is the owner of the Gateway Complex, which includes the ballpark and uh, Rocket Mortgage Field House. Gateway is the landlord of the two teams by virtue of long-term leases of the ballpark to the Guardians and the Field House to the uh, Dan Gilbert organization. Um, a little over two years ago, Gateway representatives and representatives of, of the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County met with the Guardians to commence discussions on a lease extension. The current lease expires at the end of 2023. Um, all the parties agreed initially that there, that there would be a long-term lease extension and that the uh, existing ballpark would be preserved. Um, and that's an important uh, uh, statement at the beginning because other cities 
such as Atlanta, Arlington, Texas, um, and now more recently Oakland and Tampa Bay are struggling to finance brand new uh, ballparks at billion dollar price tags. So the initial uh, agreement to focus on using our existing ballpark was important. Uh, where we ended up in the term sheet presented to this council is a 15-year lease commencing next year, January of next year, and continuing through 2036. Now, since that 15 years encompasses the last two years of the existing lease, the net addition to the lease is 13 years. Uh, we structured it the way we did for reasons that will become impar uh, apparent when the team describes the ballpark improvements, the financing, and the schedule for those. The uh, public, uh, the public share of this lease extension is $19 million a year. That breaks down to $9 million a year from Cuyahoga County, $8 million a year from the City of Cleveland, $2 million a year from the State of Ohio. $19 million. Now, where will that $19 million be spent over the 15-year term? There are two major categories. The first is what we call ballpark improvements. These are changes, modernizations to the ballpark to keep it relevant now and in the future so that through the whole 15-year term, the ballpark is consistent with the most recent facilities entering the market. Um, the cost of those ballpark improvements is comprises the public share of that cost is 11 million a year out of the total 19 million. Supplementing the public 11 million, the teams agreed to contribute four and a half million towards ballpark improvements. Together, the 11 million from the public sector, the four, four and a half million from the team, will fund a, two and a 202 million and a half million bond issue that the Cuyahoga County will, will structure. Okay, the other eight million of the 19 million will fund capital repairs. Capital repairs are basically fixing what's already there. Uh, you know, components naturally wear out over time. Things like elevators, escalators, HVAC C systems, concrete, seats, even scoreboards. Um, the gateway, my organization has projected a long-term uh, capital repair model that anticipates a uh, need to spend um, eight million a year over the 15 years. That eight million includes a, a little over a million a year as a reserve. Um, so again, 11 million a year towards ballpark improvements, which the team will describe to you later, eight million a year towards capital repairs. Uh, the specific city funding sources, uh, there are three major sources. Number one, uh, there is a source that was created as a byproduct of the Q deal several years ago. When city council passed the Q deal back in 2017, recall that uh, one of the key elements that Mayor Jackson uh, conceived was that as long as we were doing the Q deal at the time, let's create a reserve for the time when the Indians lease is up and we need some money for that. Accordingly, part of the Q deal involved creating what we call a sports facility reserve. That's part of what we approved, what your council approved back in 2017. And the result is that through the financing the county set up for the Q deal, the sports facility reserve will contribute uh, 3.2 million a year for the years 2030, 2024 through 2035. That's already in place. No further council authorization is needed to trigger that funding source. That's city source number one. City source number two, is our proposal that one half of the admission tax paid by the Guardian would be 
allocated towards this lease extension. Now, in a typical non-COVID year, the Indians' admission tax is a little over $5 million that they pay to the city. Uh, that would translate to about $2.6 million a year uh, from 50% of the admissions tax. The third major funding source is the garage net revenues. Um, the last non-COVID year for the Gateway East Garage, the Gateway East Garage netted $1,631,000 from its operations. It's our expectation that going forward, that garage can net averaged over the 15 years about $2 million a year, taking into account inflation in the later years, coupled with the fact that there's not been a price increase at the garage since 2016. Um, so uh, $2 million from garage uh, operating revenues, and additionally, we are proposing that the city sell naming rights to the garage. Conservatively, we estimate those naming rights will fetch about 330000 a year. Um, we are also pledging those rights, those proceeds, to the team. Together, the two of them equal 2330000 annually. Further, we are proposing that if the either the garage net revenues fall short or the naming rights fall short, the city would make up the difference. Um, lastly, there is a 350,000 per year item that we haven't designated a funding source. You should assume that it would be the general fund. The county funding sources have all been a, already been approved. As I mentioned before, they total nine million annually. Briefly, they consist of the existing sin tax at two and a half million a year, a bed tax at three million, and general okay. fund at two million, six million. There are there? also some twelve million dollars in county one-time revenues that would go towards the uh, lease extension. Um, in 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 the term sheet that you have as part of your. Um, documents on, on your computers. Uh, the second table there on page three shows how costs will be shared over time. Uh, just summarizing, the Indians will be, or the Guardians will be bearing a little over 10 million a year of various costs, uh, principally uh, 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 routine maintenance of the ballpark. Uh, the one half of the gateway operating expenses and the four and a half million towards ballpark improvements that I previously previously referenced. The public share, as I've already described, is 19 million a year, going towards uh, the ballpark improvements and the capital repairs. Lastly, uh, there are two five-year lease extension options. Uh, the first five years could be triggered if the city and county in a future year determine funding sources for nine million a year for capital repairs and a total of 67 and a half million for ballpark improvements. The second five-year extension is more vague because those kind of projections you out there a considerable number of years but there is an opportunity of the parties agreeing on an additional five years. Uh, as to why though it wasn't 25 or 30 years from the start, note that two of the significant funding sources, the Sports Facility Reserve and the County Syntax, each expire in the years 2034, 2035. Now down the road, we may be able to do something in terms of extending or finding funding sources, but at this time, given that those two significant sources expire 2034, 2035, that's why we're proposing the 15-year term. Uh, that concludes uh, my overview of the term sheet. I'll now turn it over to the team to review their portion of the presentation.
Good afternoon. Yes, Councilman. Please. Through the chair to Councilman Jones, the sports facility reserve at 3.2 million a year that was created by this council as a byproduct of the Q deal from 2017. To, uh, through the chair to Councilman Jones, approximately two and a half million annually. Yes. Okay, let's continue. Welcome. Good afternoon to the chair and, and all of the council members. My name is uh, Rich Dorfer. I am the uh, vice president of finance and chief financial officer of the Cleveland Guardians. I'm substituting for Christy Corpheus today because uh, she wasn't available, but she had presented previously to the Development Planning and Sustainability Committee last week. I have worked for the Cleveland Guardians for 22 years, and I appreciate the opportunity to present our economic impact and, and the fiscal impact that the Cleveland Guardians have on our community. We're on slide six of, of the presentation in case anyone wants to follow along. Um, you know, having a ballpark in downtown Cleveland is a magnet of economic activity to the area. We host 81 games a year. Many of these occur during the core summer entertainment months, drawing 1.7 million visitors from outside Cleveland to the city center. While they visit, these guests provide a substantial cash infusion with fans patronizing local pubs, restaurants, hotels, and more. This means jobs, both in the ballpark for people who work in those establishments the ballpark has helped stimulate the multi-billion dollar renaissance of downtown Cleveland and the Gateway neighborhood. No venue in our area provides more foot traffic to the small downtown businesses that they rely on the baseball fans. On page seven, we talk about some of the very direct impacts that we have related to the city government. Uh, in the last 25 years, the Guardians have contributed or directly driven approximately $150 million in total taxes to the city general fund. This is comprised of $110 million in admissions taxes and $44 million in income taxes from the Guardian's employees and the visiting teams. Well, I'm going to let him continue. It's slide seven. It's slide seven. Slide seven. Could somebody please help the councilman? Sure. Well, yeah, it's slide yeah. seven. Yeah, I'm on slide seven. Please it's, continue. it's the one that says progressive field contributes directly to city government. Yeah, please continue. What this slide doesn't include is all the income taxes from all the third party companies uh, directly working for the club. An example of that would be Delaware North that weren't included in here, and then other companies that are directly tied to uh, our presence in, in downtown. I'm going to move forward to uh, slide eight. In addition, we generate about $108 million of direct spending annually, which creates and retains additional jobs. It draws visitors, contributing $215 million annually in direct spending, and it creates 4,841 jobs annually through the employment. It's more than just the visitors. All of this activity generates significant tax dollars, too. Looking at direct local taxes paid by the Indians and our visitors, we generate $12.4 million annually. A portion of that coming to the city is from hotel taxes, parking taxes, admission taxes, and income taxes of approximately $8.9 million a year. 2020, we can use as a great example uh, during the pandemic, the impact that baseball has on local tax revenues. Without visitors at the game generating the direct taxes, it dropped by approximately 85%, going from $10 million annually to about $1.4 million in 2020. All of that direct spending creates an estimated 4,841 jobs, which makes us an important part of the employment picture in Cuyahoga County. Importantly, this impact will continue through a lease extension, yielding $5 billion in spending over 15 years. We want to move forward to slide nine. This slide basically presents our, that we're a significant employer across the city of Cleveland with employees in each of your wards. In the 17 wards, all 17 wards are directly uh, impacted by, city of, uh, by the Cleveland Guardians employees. 
27% uh, of our employees live in the city of Cle Cleveland and touch every ward and neighborhood. So we're not just a downtown incubator either. One of the questions that came up in the diversity, I'm sorry, in the Development Planning and Sustainability Committee was related to a further breakdown of our 1,680 employees. Of those 1,680 employees, there was 266 full-time employees, 323 part-time employees, and 1,091 seasonal employees to, to arrive at that 1680. That is not on this slide. That was just an additional follow-up that we had from the committee meeting last week. Another question that we had was some of the median wages. The median salary of our full-time employees was $86,700. And then the median hourly rate of our part-time employees was $12.25. And then the median hourly rate of our seasonal employees was $12.35. Yeah, if you could provide that. Um, it's we not provided the slides, that via the... Yeah. Please. Correct. And does the 80-some thousand um, for your full-time, does that include the players? Could you repeat the question? Does the, uh, the average salary of your full-time employees, does that include the players? It's the median salary does not include the players. Yeah, okay, thanks. It's going to clarify. <laughs> that number would be please slightly continue. different. Yeah, otherwise it would be quite a bit higher. But please continue. And then on the uh, tenth slide, uh, this is a slide related to our diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, our organization is committed to representing a diverse range of Clevelanders. Uh, one of our three full-time employees, one in three full-time employees are a woman or a minority at the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, over the last few seasons, we've made a considerable continued investment in this area and is a focus for the whole organization moving forward. Uh, the Guardians have been an MLB leader in this space, uh, launching an equity working team and being among the first teams to formally hire senior roles focused on diversity. Our head of diversity, equity, inclusion, his name is Matt Grimes. He's here today. Uh, so I can answer any questions related to the economic impact. Okay. Well, are we going to go to community? Is, we gonna, is there a community impact section first? I want to get through the presentation first. Yes, that's. That's to follow. So, if there was no question specific, let's. If we do this, I want to kind of have questions all in one. That's fine. Out. So, to follow will be Penny Forrester and, and Raphael Collins, and they will uh, address some of the community. Great. Please approach. Welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Penny Forster, and I'm the Director of Community Impact for the Cleveland Guardians. I've been with the team for over 20 years, and I'm a member, I'm sorry, resident of Ward 17 for the past 15 years. Recently in my ward, our starting pitcher, Tristan McKenzie, spent the school year mentoring eighth graders at Valley Boy Boys Leadership Academy. It's part of the True to You program. Tristan spent hours each month talking with students about leadership, decision-making, and career pathways. He concluded the year with a history lesson on Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby's legacy and discussion with the boys on how they, too, can be game changers. This is just one example of the deep impact we have in our community and the commitment that we have to our city. I'm proud to present a historical overview of that commitment, and my teammate Raphael will share more about our strategic vision moving forward. We consider ourselves guardians of the community. Our organization has made a statement with our recent name change, demonstrating our willingness to change and grow to better unify our community. We have a deep history of community involvement and philanthropic support, featuring an investment of over $71 million since our ballpark opened in 1994. Our focus is to prepare youth for success and utilize baseball and softball to strengthen the future of our community through service initiatives focused on youth education, health, and wellness. I'm going to skip over to slide 14 next. As I mentioned, we have committed over $71 million to our community since 1994. This type of financial impact will not slow down. While this is provided for many nonprofits in the region, the largest focus continues to be on three main groups here in Cleveland. First off, Cleveland Metropolitan School District. We provide financial support of all of their baseball and softball programs, educational support and staff development, Currently, there are 11 high schools in the school district with baseball and or softball. 
Secondly, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Northeast Ohio, where our partnership provides scholarship dollars, renovations, special programming, including a new workforce development program we piloted this year. And then finally, all youth baseball and softball in the city through our partnership with City Rec and the RBI program. We want to remove all barriers preventing youth in our community from having access to our game. Field renovations, equipment, staffing are all provided by our support. Besides these dollars, we've also provided over 1 million game tickets to youth and underserved in our community. This number does include the tickets we provide City Council and City Rec for use in your respective awards. We will continue to prioritize our dollars where we can have the greatest impact in our city. And next, Raphael Collins is going to explain kind of our future forward strategies on that. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Raphael Collins. Uh, I've been with the club for 10 years, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Community Impact and Diversity Initiatives. Uh, today, I want to take some time and share with you some of our more impactful programs. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Raphael Collins. Uh, what I want to do today is share some of our more impactful pro community programs uh, that we've instituted in 2021 and uh, moving into the future years. Uh, this, util utilizing our corporate partners, our neighborhood champions, and our club, we've identified ways to spread our reach across the entire city to as many families as possible. Sometimes this involves supporting and amplifying a good work that's already been done uh, with additional resources or even building new uh, or tweaking programs that's in existence uh, as the community needs changes. This couldn't be any evident, this couldn't be any more evident than the work we've done with the City of Cleveland uh, recreation centers. In almost every ward, we have these important resource centers set up that offer a variety of resources to assist those nearby. We believe in these programs that exist here, which is why we've stepped up to wholly support baseball and softball programs. Additionally, we do not want to rest with just the, rest with just the support of our city rec centers. Again, we understand that there are some communities that do not have these nearby. So for this reason and more, we piloted a program this year called the Playball CLE program. Uh, this program is more or less to support entrenched baseball, softball, and adaptive leagues. Uh, these leagues are fueled by passionate parents, guardians, uh, and volunteers throughout the city. It's offered to children at almost every level of baseball, uh, beginning at entry level T-ball, all the way through more skilled fast pitch programs. Uh, what has this program done for us? It's enabled us to double the amount of kids served in just the first year, uh, now serving over 3,000 kids in our community uh, within both programs. Uh, and this is just a start. Again, this was a 2021 program. We've already begun plans to continue to learn and expand this program uh, to grow in the future years. Uh, the Boys and Girls of, of Northeast Ohio, the Boys and Girls Club of Northeast Ohio. Uh, we created and implemented a program called the On Deck Development Program, uh, where this program focuses on personal, educational, and career development. Within this program, we seek to expose our young students to career paths that could exist best practices and tips within mock interviews, developing their hobbies, their personal passions, building and expanding their professional contacts, and lastly, hosting them at the ballpark for in-person experiences that are rarely offered to anyone else. Uh, next, I want to touch on our Cleveland Metropolitan School District, where we wholly support baseball and softball programs, uh, providing the necessary resources to make sure that every student athlete that wants to play the game is able to do so. Additionally, in 2021, we've modified our MLB RBI program, which if you are unfamiliar with this program, uh, it's a major league uh, quality experience offered to student athletes uh, who attend CMSD schools. Um, this program, uh, there's, there's no rival program that can offer the coaching, the development, or the experiences that come with this. And then uh, for me as a lifelong resident of War One, growing up in a large family that's benefited from the city services that represents a lot of the wards here today, uh, I can vividly remember that the, at that time the Cleveland Indians truck pulling up to John F. Kennedy Senior High School and providing the necessary resources that not just me but my teammates need to compete that season. Uh, that season ended with two Division I scholarship athletes that, that went on to play in the college space. Uh, when I think back about that time, I, I, I had no idea that that would be, but uh, it's about 20 years ago now. So that work started before the end. It's, it's continued to this day. Looking back in those high school moments in the early 2000s, it never probably crossed my mind that the baseball team that my family cheered on, uh, that would provide necessary resources for me and for my teammates and for countless other student athletes across our city, would be the same team that I would serve on uh, today to, pa to continue passing on those opportunities to the families that follow. 
I just want to add one more thing. There were some direct questions that came out of the DPS committee last week on some programming and where we're at with some of our community work. So there was another deck that I believe everyone should have received towards the end of last week that takes a deeper dive into those city partnerships that we have with these different groups like CMSD, um, Playball, and many of the others that we talked about. Um, so that should kind of give a little bit more deeper picture of all of these programs. Okay, thank you. And our next section is, anybody? Sure. Neil thank you, if you can hang around for questions when we're done, that'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Neil Weiss. I've been with the Guardians for nine years. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President Chief Information Officer, responsible both for technology for the team as well as the physical ballpark. So appreciate talking to everybody today. I'm going to attempt to condense this presentation a little bit since many of you have seen it one or more times, but I can answer any and all questions you have. Sure. So you should have it in front of you. It starts on uh, slide 17, Ballpark Improvements, Future Progressive Field. Yep. I'm going to touch on two or three slides in there, starting with slide 18, which is our mission. Our mission is very simple. It's to win the World Series and create a compelling fan experience. Every ballpark improvement we do will focus on one or more of those things. That's our guidestone for anything we do to spend that $202 million ballpark improvement fund. I'm going to skip to slide 20, which speaks to our community benefits agreement concepts. There's been a lot of great questions in this process about what our CBA will be. We will have a CBA. It'll be a project-specific CBA. It's not completed yet, but it will be very important for us to have done well before we choose a, co a construction manager. So this isn't something we're going to do after the fact. But I did want to call out some of the areas that we're going to focus on when we talk about a community benefits agreement. Um, not to be confused with the community impact work that Penny and Raf just spoke to. Those are things we do every day, every week, every year with the Guardians. This is specific to the community benefits agreement that we'll put together for this project when we talk about ballpark modernizations and ballpark improvements. So on that slide, it speaks to a couple of things. On the left-hand side, it speaks to workforce and community inclusion. On the right-hand side, it speaks to process and diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, and how we're going to go about it. So obviously, there's going to be thousands of project hours uh, for these uh, projects, hundreds or thousands of union jobs. I think that goes without saying. We know at the very, very minimum, we'll be starting with the 2013 MOU that the city of Cleveland created along with many other uh, entities in Cleveland for workforce inclusion for minority business enterprises, female business enterprises, and small business enterprises, as well as Cleveland residents. We fully expect to exceed those numbers. And in our community benefits agreement, and we will have a, a commitment to what those numbers will be. I think as you see from the, the good work that was done next door the, um, at the Cavs during the Q transfer, transformation, they did a great job of exceeding those numbers. If I remember correctly, their actuals ended up at 21% or so for MBE. I think their, um, their goal was 16%. They did a great job across the board. I think for Cleveland residents, their goal was 20%. They ended up somewhere around 45%. We have no doubt we will be doing just as well or better. Um, there's a few other things we're going to focus on. One is apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship programs. Well, we know there's a lot of great programs in the city of Cleveland right now, and so in our CBA, we want to focus on how we can support those. We're going to focus on the CMSD's Career Pathways program that exists today and how these projects can support that as well. And obviously, we'll work with the construction manager and the unions on prevailing wage rates. On the right-hand side of this slide, it speaks a little bit to a few other things. I want to call out a couple of things specifically. As part of this process, like you do for all these projects, you bring on an owner's rep. We're terming that, the slide isn't accurate here, but we're terming that the project manager's rep because technically Gateway is the owner, they are our landlord. So our project manager's rep who we'll work with either will be a minority business enterprise or our co-rep will be a minority business enterprise. That is something that we're committed to. Um, we're going to set the expectations with that rep that they are representing us. We're not abdicating the work to us, but every work, that, all work we do with everybody, they are responsible for holding us and everybody else accountable for meeting those standards. So that's not going to be an option for them. It's going to be mandatory for whatever we choose. 
Um, we have also talked about putting together a community review group. It says on the slide peer review group. We're going to term that community, peer, community review group. That will be a group of diverse and inclusive people from around Cleveland for whom they can hold us accountable as well. They can give us feedback. We can um, provide them ideas on how we are doing. We can provide reports directly to them. Uh, and they can be somebody that we can lean on regularly at the beginning of the project, all through the project, and at the end of the project as well. If you skip to slide 23, sorry, 24, where it talks about the project vision, these are the six concept areas that we have talked about working on as part of this $202 million for the Ballpark Improvement Fund. Uh, keep in mind, I'm not talking about capital repairs right now. I can speak to those as can um, Ken as well. These are just the, the modernizations um, for the ballpark to keep it modern and fresh for the next 15 to 25 years. There's six main areas, six main concepts that we've talked about. We've not hired an architect or construction manager yet, but these are based upon research we have done over the past two to three years, and they're areas that we feel very strongly about. The first four of them are specific to the fan experience. So the transformation of left field terrace, um, the, that's where our terrace club is today. The upper deck reimagined, that's the entirety of the upper deck, which we really haven't touched at all in the entirety, um, the whole lifespan of progressive field. Um, the social press box experience, that's kind of part of the upper deck, so how we can look at the future of that press box space. And the dugout experience, which is specific to the area behind home plate and the, and the dugout suites that are underneath it. The fifth one is all about winning the World Series. I think, as you know, we're a baseball team, so our goal is to win our first World Series since 1948. That's our goal every year. Um, we have not touched our clubhouse or any of the amenities associated to how we perform as a baseball team since the ballpark was opened. There's significant renovations that have to be done uh, that work for a baseball team in the 21st century um, that were not in, in 1994. Biomechanics, sports science, hydrotherapy, ED and nutrition, high-speed video analysis, many other things that currently we do not have the physical spaces to do at all, and we've fallen way behind our competition. We regularly get low or failing grades from Major League Baseball on both our home and visiting side. The last one, which we're calling our dramatic front door to gateway, is a combination of projects. It starts with our administrative building, our admin building, uh, we have more than three times the amount of employees today than we did in 1994. We don't physically have anywhere to put them. We also operate totally differently. We also want to build an additional community space, probably conference room specific, that can be available for both us and for the community to use for meetings. And then part of this is associated to the, the terraces project and then our left field gate, which 40 to 45% of all of our fans come in also would have an opportunity to be modernized to make it simple, safe, and intuitive for all of our, our fans to come in through Gateway Plaza, which we see over time becoming even more of a highlight um, of the footprint of Progressive Field. I'm going to stop there, if that's okay, because that really is the, the, the condensing the entire thing. I want to make sure I stop and be available for questions. I recognize most of these slides from uh, the last hearing. Is there anything else we need to go through before we, um, before we move to the... Uh, no, th uh, to the chair, the, that was the entirety of our slides that we presented Great. last time. Perfect. So what I would like to um, begin with, um, just so we're not repeating questions, can you please... Um, I know uh, Councilman Bracatella, there was a number of questions that were presented, um, and they, some of them have been answered throughout, but if we could uh, just kind of um, hit those first, and then we'll open up for more questions. Do you know sure. what they are? Do you? I have a list of questions that were provided before. I, I may be able to, to answer some of myself, and I may call some of my colleagues yes, to, please. to answer other ones. Please. Um, the first one is around the total cost of progressive field, including debt service. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, is that something that you or Ken want to take, or should I take it? OK, so um, I believe we sent all this information back from the, the, the information that was sent from, um, from Joe Trident. Mm -hmm. Uh, but basically, the public's commitment, about 72.5%, was $154 million. Uh, the club put in $47 million, which was about 22%. And then there were other private funding sources of about $11 million. So in totality, that was $212 million for the cost of building Progressive Field. That's the, the high level. There are some details behind that, but that's really the answer. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, is that is debt service one? Let me let me open up my email. I didn't. Yeah, I believe debt service is built into there. Joe, no. no? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Joe Zendarsek. I didn't really introduce myself the first time around. I'm Vice President General Counsel of the club. So, the, yes, the uh, Councilman Polensic is correct. He asked for debt service. Uh, we do not have all the de debt service costs associated. We've asked the county to assist us in giving us those numbers. We, if you'll note, there's really three financed portions in the uh, construction. Uh, two of them are public. One of them is the stadium revenue bonds, which were paid for by the team. I can tell you that it, it's not an easy question because all of those bonds were refunded at uh, a later point in time, in some cases to generate uh, interest rate savings, in other cases to come up with uh, additional costs that both Gateway was required to come up with and the club was required to come up with relative to uh, some improvements that were done to the scoreboard, the first set of improvements that were done to the scoreboard, which were mandated by the original lease. And the, the uh, uh, you know, we've asked Bob France for his assistance. He's the county finance director and his predecessor, Tim Oftermatt who uh, for many years was gateway chair and also county financial advisor. And um, hopefully if we have this information, we'll deliver it to you. The one thing I can tell you is that on the stadium revenue bond side, we paid approximately 26, so. well, 26 million in, in interest, but that includes the refunding of the bonds, which, as I said, went for an improvement that did not relate to the, the uh, uh, actual initial construction costs. But at least as a reference point, that would give you a reference point as to the uh, interest costs associated with the stadium revenue bonds. Thank you. Um, thank you, Joe. Councilman? Yes, please. I just wanted to make a point uh, for the viewing public, and please correct. We're discussing everything that was just discussed is the original construction of the stadium. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to cl clarify that for anyone watching, that, that that information is not what we're discussing today. That was a question referring to the initial discussion in 1994. Oh. Yeah. yeah, to the chair, to Council McCormick, thank you. appreciate that. That's all historical information. It's not... Um, necessarily relevant to what we're talking about today for this perspective lease. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question that was asked, and, and all of this information was emailed back. I, I don't know if you have it, it in front is. of you I, or not. I have not checked my email, David. I'm looking at it okay. right now. Yeah. So I'll, I'll read through what the questions were. Yeah. Um, the second question was, um, provide the revenue generated for the team by the dedicated parking spaces. Uh, so for the past six years, in 2017, it was 676741 2018, 640475. It's 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 been emailed to us. It's wait, let me list. Wait. So wait, Councilman Casey, tell me ask what's the question? Is that is that what the Indians generated or what the city generated? This is for the associated to the dedicated parking spaces for us. It's not for the in totality. So it's what you guys C correct. Thank, thank you, Councilman. Please continue. Uh, for 2019, it was 511, 180. 2020, it was zero obvi for obvious reasons. And 2021, it was 434, 382. So those were the, the six years that we provided back. Great. Uh, the third question, and um, stop me if, if uh, you need to stop me, please. Please. was for the past 10 years provide a matrix that shows the year attendance and parking revenue. Um, Ken Silman did provide that in the information back to you as well. So there's a matrix that shows uh, by year attendance as well as parking revenue for those years. So that should be in that information that was provided back. Uh, 
The fourth question was provide the expiration date and current value of the naming rights deal. There's a memo that was provided in that same packet that speaks to everything about our naming rights deal and ex explains the different parts of it, um, its expiration date and its role with us. The fifth question was provide the write-up explanation comparison of naming ring rights versus sponsorships that was referenced at the table. That's also in the same memo. Same memo. Mm -hmm. Sixth question was provide the current status of the sports betting legislation and potential revenue implications. And what was provided back is the following. Sports gaming legislation will potentially be brought to a vote the first week of December. If passed, Ohio's professional sports team will be able to apply for a license. If approved, an organization could partner with an approved gaming operator to operate a mobile or retail gaming operation and create a monetary relationship associated to things like corporate marketing. So for those of you who haven't been following that in Columbus, it has been close to a vote for quite a while. The Senate did pass a bill back in June. There's been deliberation since then, and currently they're looking at potentially bringing it to a full floor vote right after Thanksgiving. But it is still not currently legal in Ohio. Uh, the seventh question was provide a written version of the testimony provided by Tom Yablonski from the DPS committee the other day. That was also included in the packet. The eighth question was provide a further breakdown of employment data to include full-time, part-time, seasonal, including median salary and hourly rate. This is what um, my colleague Rich Dorfer provided earlier, about 30 minutes ago. Um, I can go through that one more time. We have 1,680 uh, guardians and Delaware North employees. That breaks out to 266 full-time. 323 part-time, and 1,091 seasonal. The median salary is 86,700. That does not include player salaries. $12.25 an hour for part-time and $12.35 for seasonal. One note I'd add to that is we are and have been going through a full assessment of our seasonal wage rates and do expect, expect those to rise in the coming one to three years, but specifically in the next year. The ninth question was provide a written copy of the community involvement presentation that identified specific capital improvements, programming, and citywide enhancements. That was also provided in um, the present, the packet that you have, and much of it was referred to by Penny and Raf a few minutes ago. The tenth question was provide a copy of the hiring and employment goals that are referenced in the legislation and used by Gateway. Um, Ken provided that separately as well. The eleventh question was provide a total amount of dollars that will be used to improve the administration space. So this question I think was asked by um, uh, Council Member Spencer at our last meeting. The short answer is, is we're, we're assuming that that entire project, roughly 50% of that project is the administration space. The rest of it is some combination of that communal conference space we talked about, some additions to the Terrace Club project, as well as some changes to our left field gate. That's why we gave it a, a generic conceptual turn of a, a dramatic new front efference to Gateway. It is not all referred to our, our admin building. Uh, question 12 was how many garage spaces are reserved to the teams per the respective team's leases? Um, uh, Ken Silliman provided this in the packet as well. Um, the next question is to provide a more detailed breakdown of ballpark attendees, including residency of attendees. Um, this had previously been, been provided. If it's not in your packet and it's not in previous information, I'm sure we can send it again. And then the last question was, on the subject of community benefits, what is the Guardian's timetable for the peer review group? Um, that was one of the last things I just mentioned. Um, we're actually calling that our community review group. We will have that in place before we choose a construction manager. It won't be something we will do after the fact. I think those were all the questions, unless there are ones that I, that I missed. That's the list that I had in front of me. Okay, thank you. What I'd like to do is, uh, Council Brink, tell you, is that a fair summation of the questions that were presented from DPS? Yes. Okay, and then I want to go to questions now. Councilman Charles Slife was first on my list. Mr. Chairman, can you put me down? All yep. right. Councilman Jones. Thank you. And, uh, thank, you know, I'm not on finance, but thank you, Chair, for letting me sit in. Uh, this is important, obviously. And uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Silliman and the Guardians for sending over the information. Uh, I was able to leaf through it uh, specific to the questions that I had raised last week during DPS. And I want to start there. Um, before doing so, just underscore again, my, my main focus through all of this is understanding what we're doing as a council to especially protect the general fund. Uh, I understand that there are aspects of this that are kind of analogous to an enterprise fund, but what I want to make sure is that we are 
um, not sacrificing city services uh, you know, by signing on to a, a deal prematurely. Through the chair to Mr. Silliman, uh, thank you for providing the matrix uh, comparing attendance and garage revenues. Uh, just to confirm, I'm hearing myself. Just to confirm, are the numbers provided annually for the garage net revenues, that's net for all, all annually for all events, all parking, not specific to baseball, is that correct? Through, through the chair to Councilman, through, through the chair to Councilman Slife, yes, that's correct. That's for all events at the garage. And, and net meaning that's the profit afterwards, it says that there's a higher gross value? Through, through the... Through the chair to Councilman Slife, that means uh, that means uh, after all expenses are paid, um, as I previously testified, the general fund has never seen that net because the net goes directly towards retirement of the parking revenue bonds. Those bonds will be permanently retired next year. Thank you. And uh, again to Mr. Silliman, uh, during your portion of the presentation you had mentioned the last increase at the Gateway East Garage, that was 2016 you said? Is that correct? Through the Chair to Councilman's life, yes. Do you recall roughly what the increased rates were and did they take effect in 2016 or did they begin yes. in 2017? Yes. The, in the specific increases were for all arena <coughs> events, the uh, rates were increased from $15 a night to $20 a night. For all ballpark events, the rates were increased from $12 a night to $15 a night, and those rates are still in effect today. Thank you. And so, so for those of my colleagues who didn't have a chance to uh, participate in DPS, Last week, my, my reason for asking this question and uh, requesting this matrix was to compare attendance annually against garage revenues, and I was trying to piece out, uh, are we setting ourselves up for some sort of disaster because people keep coming to the games but fewer and fewer are driving? Uh, there's more ride share options, there's public transit, there's you know scooters and e-bikes and what have you. And from looking at what we have as 2015 through 2019, uh, it, it honestly, it, it, it sort of, uh, it, it fluctuates, you know, some year uh, revenues are up and attendance is down, some, some years the other. Uh, but I wanna focus on uh, 2016. So in 2016, we all remember the, uh, the, we were in the World Series. Uh, that was a big year for Cleveland basketball as well. So if you're talking about events going on at Gateway, you know, that's kind of like the marquee uh, that you'd want to peg yourself, or maybe that's what you would never think you could even overcome. Um, attendance at uh, Progressive Field that year was about 1.6 million. Parking revenues were uh, 1.1. And again, that's parking revenues, $1.1 $1 million, not just for baseball, for everything. And I bring this up because as, uh, my, and correct me if I'm wrong through the chair, but as I read what's being proposed in this deal, it's $2 million a year annually in parking revenues. In 2016, it was 1.1. 1 .1. uh, so what I see is we're, we're very much below that, even in 2019, the most recent year up to one, it was up to 1 1.6, but that's still hundreds of thousands of dollars below the $2 million that's on this term sheet. When you add that onto the $350,000 of unspecified funding, it's looking, you know, in, in a, a good year on this, $718,000 coming out of the general fund on a, on a bad year, 1.3 million. I guess I should pause there and confirm that my understanding of this is correct before I keep going. Through the chair to Councilman Slife, um, in year 2016, um, the city and the team were still in the process of working out an arrangement where the team was being more creative in allowing the city access to some of the team reserve spaces. I think you can look at the increase up to 1.6 million as largely driven by that new operating procedure. So I submit that the, 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 the year 2019 is a very good 
uh, year as a template. Now, granted, 1.63 million is short of 2 million. But as I pointed out earlier, uh, we have gone five years without a parking rate increase. Certainly, if you look at what the adjoining lots are charging, there is considerable room for an increase. Um, and if you, if you couple that with the fact that what's important about the $2 million a year is that it be an average over 15 years. So I would expect in, in the early years that you might be a little under $2 million, but I think given the parking rate increases coupled with inflation, uh, that would, uh, in the latter years, I think it's reasonable to assume the rate would be over $2 million. But assuming your worst case scenario, Councilman, and let's say that between the 350000 amount and the deficit in the parking garage operations, that that's 700000 or so. Keep in mind that every year the general fund benefits from the team's existence to the tune of $9 million. Um, this deal provides for payment of $8 million a year to the team. So even assuming your worst case scenario, um, the team's presence, assuming the $8 million is approved by council, the team's presence still more than makes up for that uh, in terms of the net effect on the general fund. Now, uh, admittedly, Cleveland Scene did an article on Friday where they point out that, that, that today uh, the general fund derives the whole $9 million benefit from the team's presence, and if you do this transaction, the net it goes from nine million down to one million because you're now paying out eight million. Um, my response to that is simply this: We are dealing with a 27-year-old ballpark that has increasing capital repair needs and that is competing against brand new facilities in other cities with the latest innovations. This plan before you. Uh, couples the modernizations with the capital repairs, and it is admittedly expensive. But again, I submit that extending the useful life of a six of a 27-year-old facility for another at least 15 years, and possibly um, 20 or 25, is still worth doing. When you look at what Atlanta faced with its new ballpark and a billion-dollar price tag, Arlington, Texas, a billion-dollar price tag. Right now, Oakland is in the crosshairs. The price tag there is $855 million. Tampa is in the crosshairs, and they're being asked to come up with $400 million for a part-time stadium split with the city of Montreal. Baltimore is in the crosshairs, and who knows what their deal is going to be. So in terms of putting everything in perspective, I think it's important to remember that the general fund benefits $9 million a year from the team's presence. Thank you. And uh, my, my reaction, I had two reactions uh, to, to your answer. Thank you for it. Um, one is that, you know, it's, I guess I would prefer a setup that is, um, you know, an up to amount and even above two million, I'd say up to $2.2 million. But if it's less than two million, that the, we're, we're, the city is not held to the number. Uh, it's, it's variable, kind of comparable to what's been negotiated with the admissions tax. Uh, I think that that's a strategy that could potentially, you know, as, as I just said, and this is back, this is thinking aloud to a degree, um, net more money. Uh, for these repairs while also holding the general fund harmless. Um, my second point is that, you know, I know that we as the council have the ability to, uh, through legislation, raise the parking rates at, at Gateway. It's easy to guess that that's, you know, the next stop on this journey. I guess I, I'm, I have a hesitance in 
inking this deal without that as a companion piece of legislation and just doing it all in one go so that we know we're to crossing all of our T's and dotting all of our I's and not anticipating that a, a future body uh, would be amenable to that. Um, so, uh, Mr. President, that's, that is my, uh, that's sort of my piece on that and I, I'm still determining um, where we should go. I, I am inclined to agree with some of the members who would like to see this uh, not pass this evening held off so that we can review information that's come in and, and still have time to ask additional questions. Um, my final question, and I apologize for using so much time. Um, Mr. Chair, is this sort of assistant deal, assistance deal subject to the Fair Employment Wage Law, the Section 189 of the Charter? I don't know. I, I ask, the, the, the reason for asking, and, and thank you for providing the uh, hourly and seasonal uh, rates, which were $12 and, and some change. Uh, you know, I think right now that is, in, in my opinion, low. Uh, transparently, you know, my wife went back to work. We had a second kid. Uh, we couldn't get childcare without paying $20 an hour. So uh, I'd like to see the guardians raise that hourly rate uh, for uh, part-time and seasonal employees. And I'm curious what mechanisms we have within city law and, and this contract to compel that to happen. Uh, but I know that's a big issue and, and that's something I can, I, can, I can go to our own city staff and understand the implications of section 189. Uh, but the message to the Cleveland guardians is, is that it's, it's great how many we employ. It's great that there's so many Cleveland residents, uh, but the inflation we're seeing, the tight labor market, you know, $12 and 24 cents an hour isn't gonna cut it in my opinion. Through, through the mm -hmm. chair to uh, Councilman Slife, uh, the councilman's two points about capping potential general fund exposure and coupling this legislation with a garage increase um, are council policy issues, and I'm not going to speak to those because that's for the council to deliberate. But the portion I do want to respond to is the councilman's statement on the timeliness of acting now or shortly after now. Um, as we expressed at the previous uh, meeting on that question, the interest rate questions and the pending inflation that we're all seeing are critical cost issues for the public over time. Right now, we are still beneficiaries of a very competitive bond interest rate, but if we delay much further, given inflation that we're all seeing, that could go away. Now, secondly, the construction timeline for the team is, is it's very uh, important that they be able uh, to commence that activity next month while the, while the ballpark is still shut down and there are efficiencies lost if, if that doesn't happen. Lastly, uh, at the last meeting, uh, one of the council members asked um, what the typical timeline in negotiating lease extensions are in other cities. And they vary, but I did testify then, and I want to emphasize to this council today that the Cleveland Browns left this city with three years remaining on their lease. I, I, I'm not going to take all the time to go into sports facilities around the nation and timelines and everything else, but when you reach the three-year timeline, a lot of very difficult things start to kick in, and the, each month you go past that, you incur risks that we do not want to incur here. And if I need to expand on that later, I will, but I, I, did want to, I didn't want that timing question to go without a response. Thank you. No, actually, you can't. I've got, we've got a number of speakers on the, uh, on the agenda. Councilman Slife, did you have further questions? If, if, uh, just, just, I'll wrap it up by asking if uh, any work has been done to determine what the parking rate would need to increase to in order to close that about $350,000 gap. Have we, has there been any consulting work or is that, is that all need to start from step one? To, to the chair, to Councilman Slife, no, but it wouldn't take long to 
put that together. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Conwell, you had a point? Yeah, uh, I was back listening to the, uh, I'm sorry, sir, Mr. What's, what's your name? Uh, Mr. Neil Weiss. Okay, and I looked at the um, community benefit agreement, but I don't see through the chair, black on black um, trade council. You know, we, we need them to be at the table. Have you talked with them? Have you reached out to, because we need African-American families to be working, and I believe in the power of, um, of work. Um, through the chair to Councilman um, Conwell, absolutely. We have uh, started several different conversations. We've had some with uh, Norm Edwards from Black Contract Association. We, he met with us at the ballpark about a month ago. Um, we've had multiple conversations with the uh, Cuyahoga County Citizens Advisory uh, Group on Equity. That community review group that I mentioned, the, the presumption is, is that group will be made up of a very diverse group of people, including members of the union, members of Black Contractors Association, potentially a member from here, uh, the Cuyahoga County um, head of DE&I, mm -hmm. members of our team. So as, as um, representative a group as we can put together, to be that community review group to work with us. That group doesn't exist yet, but that group will exist before we bring on a construction manager. Yeah, because you're gonna have a, a project um, team that will give us progress reviews to the chair. Is it quarterly? Are you asking on request? I like to see it quarterly. Yep, um, through the chair to Councilman Conwell, absolutely. So one of the goals of the creation of that project CBA and then that community review group is to establish that frequency. I think community is, uh, sorry, quarterly is easy to do. Um, and it shouldn't be something in my mind that is done upon request. It's something that we do proactively. So we'll establish a timeline every month, every quarter, whatever it ends up being, we'll, we'll produce a report. Today, a member of Ken's staff on Gateway already does that. Um, and she did a great job on the, the Q deal. We will absolutely do that same thing, and it will be, we'll push it out. We won't wait for people to ask us for it. Yeah, and you know what, through the chair, uh, and you could do this now instead of waiting um, to put together your, your, um, your um, you know, what we're going to do with the project, you know. The, but you could do purchasing and procurement right now, and that's ongoing. So, you know, a project has, you have a beginning, and you have an ending when the project will close out, mm -hmm. and then we're not working as African Americans or diversity. You could push dollars through into the economy through purchasing and procurement. For example, doing preventive maintenance on, on, uh, on the building. For example, um, purchasing office supplies, equipment, as well as other resources through the chair. And that could be included with your project team. Um, through Chair Councilman Conwell, I think that's a um, great idea. One of the three things that we talked about with the case group, the Citizens Advisory Council on Equity, mm -hmm. was about procurement on our day-to-day -day work, right. not associated to this project. So we yes. have a follow-up meeting with them to talk about what best practices they have to ensure that we've got the right minority enterprises available in the supplier gateway to bid on projects. So we talked about that very same thing. Um, so I think your point is well taken, that it's not just about this project, it's about procurement in general, because we procure things through our, generated, yep. our general operating expenses every day. So where are you right now? Then the the get back to the list when you're, after you're uh, And, and, and yeah. then I yield. When we look at numbers, and you talked, Mr. you Chairman. just got finished narrating to us about oh, diversity. So where are we at now time. with hiring, uh, uh, working with, um, African Americans dealing with purchasing and uh, procurement with office and supplies and resources because that would tell me which direction we're going with this project, this project right here. Um, through the chair to Councilman Conwell, I, I'm not totally sure I understand your question. Is, with with you percentages, it's like us purchasing, us, uh, um, um, you're buying from us, you're buying power. With dealing with purchasing and procurement, are you at 25%, 30% that you're buying from African Americans, office supplies, equipment? Uh, how many you have black on black, um, us doing preventive maintenance on the, um, on the building? So um, through the Chair of Councilman Conwell, I, I can't give you those percentages right now, but we can follow up with them in because terms of the reports that we've done from a procurement standpoint in previous years, as well as 
any other information we can put together for you to answer your question, but I don't have that off the top of my head. I yeah, apologize. Yeah. And, and you know what, to the chair, and, and I, you know, I, I get excited about this, I sit back and I listen, uh, it would tell us, because trans tell you, you, you're here narrating, I don't know you, and I'm not saying that you're wrong, but if I can look at the numbers, you're saying that um, you're, you deal with the African-American communities, that 10% or 20% that you deal with us, and how are you gonna build the numbers up when you start the project? Because it tells me something. Okay. Trans tells us, it would tell a story. Yeah. And that's okay. why I'm at to the chair, and, and I know that our attorney, Silliman, uh, can get that for us. Is that correct? <laughs> so, get what, I'm sorry. He knows what I'm talking about. I'm looking at purchase yes. center and procurement numbers, dealing with minorities, dealing with African Americans. Yeah, we'll because oftentimes when people come to us and they start a project, guess what? Mm -hmm. African Americans are not included in the project. They tell us, but when you see that you've been working with us, it tells us a story. Because that's how your energy will compel you to do it, is to work with African Americans. It looked good on paper, mm -hmm. but if you've been doing it, then I know that you're gonna do it, because it, it tells me about your history. Got it. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Councilman. President. Councilman Jones? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, I just wanna set the stage, you know, here. Um, we had quite a bit of talk about uh, this subject matter, and I just want to set the stage for the audience and for the council and for the citizens of the city of Cleveland. This council has had a long history of supporting our sports teams and making it a commitment. So when I hear the veiled threat that the Cleveland Indians will possibly move because of all these other deals and constantly being reminded of that um, is to me as an elected official and a, a long resident who, by the way, love the Cleveland Indians, um, don't like the tactics, don't like the threat to be up under the gun, to make a decision that this council just received this documentation in our box on October the 4th. So we have less than 45 to 50 days to deliberate, and we're sitting here talking about all of these finite details, uh, which we don't have all the information to, uh, and which we've just heard testimony that we didn't even have anybody from the, the law department to even be a part of this. And if there's someone in the law department, their name hasn't been presented to this council, uh, nor has any of their information. And to have a deal of this caliber sitting here at the table and not have someone from the law department that was a part of this deal um, smacks this council right in the face. And then second, not to have one of the most able, uh, capable uh, people that I know of, of uh, who've been working here in terms of professional, uh, not to have the director here at this table of finance or the director of the law department uh, here to talk about this issue uh, puts the city council at a disadvantage. When we start talking about projections, resources, monies, and what does that actually mean, there's a number of items here, Mr. President, that I want to talk about and want to get clarification and understand. Um, certainly this council supports the past work of previous councils. We would certainly love and want to see our beloved Indians stay here in the city of Cleveland uh, and stay committed to this town. Uh, one of my concerns that is uh, very important to put at the table, I don't like the concept of the 15-year deal. I think that what we're offering and what we have contributed as a city to keep the Cleveland Indians in this city uh, speaks for itself. Uh, that we should have a long-term deal. Now, you gentlemen have had the opportunity, according to the finance director, as well as according to Mr. Silliman in his presentation uh, on uh, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday of last week, you've been working on this for two years. So we have only have less than some days here to deliberate through this. And Mr. Chairman, to underscore the whole process, this has been an election year for us. So we just got out of an election in September coming into November, ending in November 2nd. 
So this council uh, needs to have more time to deliberate on the issues. At the end of the day, the deal may be a good deal uh, compared to looking at uh, what Mr. Silliman has been talking about in terms of other cities. But this council wouldn't have the opportunity to totally deliberate that process because it's thrown at us at the last second and then we're being told we better go ahead and pass it off or else we may lose our, our, our team. Uh, and so that doesn't sit well. Uh, to have a big stick on the other side and swinging it uh, in these uh, deliberations as it relates to this. Because what it is and what it means to someone like me is that, you know, I better do this or else lose the team versus trying to dig deep and try to figure out is there something else, another way we could look at it. Now, we talk about, Mr. President, and getting into it, we talk about the naming rights memo. It's an issue I want to talk about. I want to know a little bit more about that. We talk about the purchase of the $25 million garage and, and, and those funds, and, and what does that mean for our city in terms of the deal. And then we also, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. President of City Council, we talk about the development of this parcel. We don't have any photos of the parcel. We don't know how big the parcel is. We don't know any of that information. None of it has been made available. So Mr. Chairman, I want to start there because that's the least information that I have here in front of me is the parcel, where is it located, how much space are we talking about here, and, and what is the value of this particular parcel? Thank you. Can somebody please answer that question? To the chair, to Councilman Jones, the parcel is located, it fronts on East 9th Street. It is roughly one third of an acre. The county, asset, the county uh, auditor lists the property as being worth $1,995,000. The, par the parcel is owned by Gateway, um, and the term sheet proposes that Gateway sell the parcel to the team for the price of $2 million. And Mr. Chairman, to uh, Mr. Silliman, um, you're the president and head of the Gateway complex? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, I am chairman of a five-member uh, board that manages Gateway and has an executive director named Todd Greathouse. And, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. President, to um, the, Mr. Silliman, uh, as you're the chairman, what is the address of that parcel? Um, I believe I sent, per, per the uh, October 4th meeting, I believe I sent a aerial of the parcel. I don't know the specific address, uh, but it literally, it is at the northwest corner of Bolivar and East 9th Street. So Mr. Chairman, I don't have either. So can Mr. Silliman make available uh, this actual location or where the said parcel is located? Uh, could give either the parcel number uh, with this or the actual address. If, if he somebody had, could please if he provide had it right that to the now, then I could look it up and see what I'm it. looking at. Thank you. We'll get that um, to you, Councilman. So, so that particular project, and I'm going to ask the same question, Mr. Chairman, um, because of time, and I don't want to get too deep, but I sort of got a general idea of all of this just going through it. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Silliman for the information that he emailed me on Thursday so I can gather most of that and some of the stuff that I wanted to ask questions on it. It, it was, uh, I had those answers, uh, those, those answers to those questions I had. So, but getting to it, Mr. Chairman, to um, the Cleveland Indians, uh, having this, uh, this um, parcel does what for the organization? Why is this important? To the council person, uh, I, I think I'm going to give part of this answer, and I may have to ask Neil to help me a little bit here. But I can't hear you. sorry, the parcel is immediately adjacent to. The parcel is immediately adjacent to our gate entry off of East 9th Street, and it butts up against 
the Gateway Garage. It, it is in many ways, in our view, a, an opportunity for us to expand someday our footprint in a way that allows us to be more active in the community and have a greater focus on community development inside the historic Gateway area. It obviously has never been developed. It existed the day the ballpark opened up for business. And it has certain limitations. It has certain benefits. But in our mind, particularly as we think about the garage and its future and the area immediately surrounding us and that area's future, something that we see as being significant. For that reason, we're willing to take control of the property. We have no actual development plans for the property at this point, and we look to develop it going forward. Neil? Uh, yeah. Councilman Jones, I, I agree with everything that, that Joe just said. It is a small parcel. I think it's roughly about four-tenths of an acre, max. Can I show this aerial map so you can tell me where it's located on sure. this map, please? Yeah. Thank you. And why he's bringing that. Isn't that presently where there are a lot of the statues and other so, things at? Right there? It's right there. There are a lot of trees there right now okay. and a bench. Yeah, there's, there's trees and wood chips. That's it. It's at the, it's at the, um, the eastern termination of the garage, bordering East 9th Street and Bolivar and directly adjacent to our right field gate where about 45% of our fans come in. Okay. But to Joe's point, we don't have any plans for it, but we do recognize that the experience for our fans includes before game, during the game, and after game. And so any opportunity we can have to potentially enhance that experience, we're interested in. But beyond that, we don't have any details or plans. Councilman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, so the, the same question would apply on this parcel. Um, maybe not as so as much as the, the $25 million garage um, piece to purchase price. Um, the question would be, would this be a deal breaker if you didn't get this little small parcel? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll answer Joe and please, please weigh in. I think similar to the garage, it's very important to us. Um, we think it could potentially play a role in the future of progressive field and the boundaries of progressive field. It's a very small part of the overall deal, I think, as, as you know. Um, but it potentially could have an outsized impact to, you know, five or, or ten years down the road. I um, see. And, and so, Mr. Chairman, um, to uh, Gateway, or did you want to add to that, Joe? Well, I just want to add one, one, one key point. Those proceeds are going into the deal. They <laughs> represent a contribution of the public to the deal. So the, the dollars that we're paying for that are turning around and going into the deal. So we would have some concerns, obviously, about what the alternate funding sources would be if there was a decision made not to uh, sell the parcel. Talking about the deal, then how much, when we look at this here, because there was a couple of questions that were asked, and um, one was community benefits, because I noticed that that was really talked about heavily. Uh, the community benefits and what the community would uh, receive, but I really didn't see anything fundamental um, through my reading um, of it. And I was looking at your memorandum of understanding uh, that was drafted for 2013, uh, but I did not see, uh, and I don't know if there's any availability to this, um, when these agreements are done, part of that agreement, uh, Mr. Mr. President to Mr. Silliman, uh, was that a part of the, the deliberations of your organization in that particular period of time to put this understanding together uh, as it relates to community benefits? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, in February of 2013, Mayor Jackson held a press event with business community leaders to announce a collective understanding on what they called a community benefits agreement, a mm -hmm. seven or eight page document mm -hmm. that 
the Mayor Jackson and uh, business leaders such as Greater Cleveland Partnership, University Hospitals, and others were recommending as a template going forward for major uh, development projects, major investments. Um, less than a year later, my predecessors on the Gateway Board uh, adopted a resolution endorsing that agreement as a guide for gateway investments going forward. Um, that's the history of that particular uh, agreement. However, um, as the, the we- The question, Mr. Chairman, was, because I don't want to belabor the time. The question was, did you, were you a part of, was your organization a part of putting together the memorandum? Did you guys write this? Uh, through, through the chair to Councilman Jones, uh, I was yeah. not on the Gateway Board at the time, so I can't speak to it. I believe not. I was very involved, uh, along with my colleague, uh, Chief Natoya Walker Minor, with Mayor Jackson's work on the community benefit agreement and the rollout to the business community. I do know that it was well received and Gateway was one of the parties that responded positively to the rollout. And may I, if I could, is this Unless the same you're at 14 endorsements? Minutes, Councilman. Is this the same endorsement? And Mr. Chairman, I might have to be put back on the back roll of this. Is this Do the same? Best. Is this the same? Because this is very important. Is this the same endorsement where you have, um, of course, the City of Cleveland, Greater Cleveland Partnership, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, Urban League of Greater Cleveland, and so on, et cetera. It goes to hard had women. They all uh, endorsed this. Was this that agreement, through, Mr. Chairman? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, yes. And if you go to page six, I think, you'll see that the goals were 15% uh, MB, 8% FB. I'll get to that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Councilman, you have one the, more the question, The question please. is, um, and then I'd like to be put back on, Mr. Chairman, um, the demand for driven workforce study you have bullet point one, and you go all the way to about several different bullet points, and you even break it down a little bit more in depth. Uh, is there any information, Mr. Chairman, that you could provide this council uh, as relates to this agreement and uh, what was the actual outcomes of the agreement? Because I don't see anything that talks about numbers, uh, workforce development. I see nothing here about apprenticeship Can you programs. Can you question for the councilman? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, the best example of output is the Q deal. Um, Mr. Weiss made reference to Gateway staff, uh, specifically Daniela Nunnally, the Got chief him. of staff at Gateway, has been very involved over time in monitoring major projects. And the Q deal, as Mr. Weiss indicated, <coughs> well exceeded all those percentages, and that was through a collaboration by the uh, uh, project manager of the Q transformation project, the Gateway staff, the Cavaliers organization, and I do believe from our discussions with the Guardians that they will uh, be just as effective in, the, in achieving those higher goals. Okay, so, so, so I'm going to have to Chairman, put you back on the list, Council. Yeah, just to end it back on, on this list. particular okay. point here. Please, if you could make Mr. it President. brief, I'd appreciate it. We have a lot thank, of people thank on you, the Mr. list. Thank you, Mr. President. There's a lot of people. I will. Please. Mr. President, thank you for giving me the consideration to conclude with this particular point. Please. Uh, Mr. President, to uh, Mr. Silliman, can you make available for this Cleveland City Council, you talk about a workforce study and other activities that was a part of this whole piece. Can you give us a presentation, make a presentation to this council, or give to us what was actually accomplished by this agreement? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, I, I would ask that that presentation be by your own uh, OEO office because they were the principal 
implementers of the agreement, and they could speak to that much better than I could. M Mr. Chairman, this was made a part of this presentation, so it's in play. And so, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman, if you were going to say that, you should not have put this into play. Thank and so, you, Mr. Councilman. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman, you know, you guys put the agreement together, and so you, you should be able to bring to this table, uh, and Mr. President, you know, this is important. Uh, yeah, if you'd please finish, Councilman. Because what we're talking about is we have a, a similar, to make on this. we're talking please, about sorry. a similar similar agreement, Mr. President, that we want to put in play for the future. So if we can't hold accountable the past, then, Mr. President, why are we even here sitting Not at the you. table? We just might as well just say, give them everything they want and just, just not even deliberate and speak here. So the question, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman. This is the absolute last question. Please ask right now. It, it has already been asked. I'd like to okay. have this presentation. Okay. His organization the Request drafted so it. noted. Councilman Mike Plensick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues. And so if I could, I want to direct my comments to everybody on this, at the table here, so if I could see everybody. Um, I was here, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, for the very uh, detailed debate that took place in the 90s, early 90s, with regard to the entire gateway complex, commitments, promises, et cetera, et cetera. So do, do I believe that the, um, the advent and the construction of Gateway has benefited downtown Cleveland? I do. I do believe that. The question that we have to ask ourselves is the cost. The cost of that and the, and the promises and the commitments that were made. And I've never forgot about those commitments and those promises is because I've got them all written down and I've got all the literature that came out as a result. So, Mr. Chairman, you know, I'm a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. Um, and I believe in the fact that at times we have to help businesses to achieve certain goals and certain things that we want to see happen in the city of Cleveland. So the, the, the challenge before us today is looking at this new agreement and trying to figure out um, the actual cost and how it in the long run benefits our citizens. And I say that in light of the fact, as I mentioned during the course of discussions, that the recent Q deal, uh, they picked up two thirds, the team ownership picked up two thirds of the cost, while this deal, the taxpayers are picking up two thirds of the cost. And so as I start to drill down, um, and let me just say this, um, the overall cost of, progress, of, of Gateway, specifically Progressive Field, when you tell me at the table you can't tell us what the, what the um, debt service is, you know doggone well you can tell us what the debt service cost is. I mean, give me a break. Give me a break. And the reason why you don't want to tell us what the cost is, because if the citizens saw exactly what this really cost, they'd be mortified. They'd be mortified what the cost is over all these years. And if you add in the, the Brown Stadium and the Q, not only would they be mortified, they'd be in shock what these projects have cost us. So I'm saying to those of you, and I want to look down the table again, including Mr. Gentile, who's here representing the city, when, when we look at what I'm dealing with and what my colleagues, my honorable colleagues are dealing with in this city, and I really dispute Tom Yablonski's comments that we're not the, either the, the poorest. I, I, after his comments, I went and I started looking at pu national publications because he questioned Cleveland.com's um, figures. We are either one or two, and every national publication, everything I looked at, either poverty, not only total poverty, but childhood poverty. We have between one and two. 4,000 abandoned houses, a, a, a massive uh, disparity in our neighborhoods, massive issues with lead contamination. I could go all down the list, and what we're being told again at this table, and, I, and again, the th the, even the subtle threats don't even mean anything to me anymore. I've heard more threats in my time here than, than, than you can shake a stick at. Don't mean anything. We're being told, again, 
that were the possibility of comparing us to Tampa and Jacksonville and this city and that city. Well, you know what? They're not wrestling with the massive poverty and despair that we're wrestling with in this city. So I'm looking at it strictly from a dollar standpoint. We're being asked again um, to support in this agreement the possible sale of the Gateway Garage within the agreement for an estimated $25 million. There are 2,200 2, spaces, and yet at this moment the Indians control 1,500 of those spaces on their game days. And then on other game days, the Cavaliers control 1,500 of those spaces. The actual cost, my brothers and sisters, my honorable colleagues, of Gateway Garage to date, to date is, I want to, I don't, I want to shock you a little bit here, is $89 million. Wow. And we're going to be, and we're going to sell it for 25? Cha-ching! Cha-ching! Somebody ought to be doing Burger King commercials here. $89 million. That's what we have spent to date on the Gateway Garage with construction and debt service. And, and we're going to give it away for $25 million? Please spare me. I'm a capitalist. We're being asked again, we're being asked to support the $8 million agreement. And I want to ask Mr. Gentile, explain to the viewing public, again, the 3.2 million sports facility fund, where does it come from? From the chair of the, count, from the, chair of the councilman, that, that was uh, developed by the Q deal, but it's emissions tax. Emissions tax. The, the 2.0, the 2. million, the parking garage, and it comes directly out of the, the revenue that, you have, that you've told us comes from the garage, correct? From the chair of the councilman, yes, and parking, it's uh, important to understand, is an enterprise fund, so that's not part of the general fund, those revenues have never went to the general fund um, because it's an enterprise fund. Does it come from all the garages or just the gateway garages? From the chair to, to the councilman, uh, that the two million comes, the two million estimated comes from the gateway garage. Okay. But the other parking revenue for other garages like Willard also goes into the parking fund? Of course they do. Of course they do. And the 2.6 million in emissions tax comes from the, the, the people who go to the games, correct? Chair of the council, and yes. Okay. Then we're being asked to kick in 333,000 in garage naming rights and another 350 in unspecified costs. The naming rights expire, my colleagues, in, um, first of all, the sports fund expires in 2035. The naming rights expire in 2024. Um, the city could be on the hook for $4.4 .4 million from the general fund on the naming rights if no one steps up to the plate. And also on unspecified funds, which is right here, 350 unspecified, which Ken said is general fund. That's 5.25 million over the course of the agreement. You know what I learned? George Forbes taught me something here, my honorable colleagues, a long time ago. Never commit the general fund. Never commit the general fund to any project. That's police, fire, EMS. That's recreation. That's our neighborhood services. Never commit. Never put that on the line for any project. And here we are at this point. We're being asked to put that on the line. And yet, with the agreement, with the extended naming rights memo, the Indians, uh, excuse me, um, guardians, are going to, just during the extension, are going to make $45 million on the naming rights. I don't get it. I, I, I want to see a balanced deal. I want to see a fair deal. We're yeah. being asked, the citizens are asked to carry the overall burden of this, of these enhancements 
And the team is going to, as the team that pays no property taxes, the team continues to make the money and the revenue, and we continue to foot the bill. Now, it's no wonder why all the owners are billionaires. I understand that. That's the world in which we live today. But all I'm asking is some, for some parity and fairness here. Par some parity and fairness. So, Mr. Chairman, to the representatives and to the city representative here, you know, I, I crunch the numbers. I appreciate everything that's been sent over to us. Um, we, we, the taxpayers, have paid dearly. Now, do you want to argue that we, we got a stadium and the Indians are over there? I guess you could argue that point, but we paid for it. The citizens paid for it. We sacrificed. And we have lost the equivalency of two whole council wards in the last 10 years in population in this city. And now we're being asked again to continue to plow money, critical monies and resources, into sports complexes and being told again that this is the cure-all to our city's ills and our, and our needs and our wants. And I can tell you, my brothers and sisters, the proof is in the pudding. It hasn't worked. And every official and national document I read will tell me such, that tying sports enhancements to neighborhood stability and city disability is not true. It's a fake and it's a fraud. So all I'm asking for is parity. I'm asking for fairness. I'm asking for the team owners to understand and become real partners with this in this city as it pertains to the problems that I'm dealing with and my colleagues. And as a senior member, I can say that because I've been here longer than anybody else. I've heard all the promises, and yet our population continues to drop. Our poverty continues to increase. Three minutes, please. So at the end of the day, if you really want me to be a partner with you, you're going to have to come back and you're going to show me how you're going to really benefit our neighborhoods. And, and have direct linkage and ties to our neighbors and jobs and supporting minority businesses and small businesses in our neighbors. Direct links and, and ties. Because if not, all it is is lip service that we've received over all these decades and nothing changes except more poverty and more despair. And, and a greater lack of, of concern for our neighborhoods. I mean, really, I mean, and then I have to read a document, then you guys want to pound yourself on a chest and say you gave me a, a baseball field, or you gave one of my colleagues a baseball field, and it's surrounding that baseball field in, in, the, in the shadow of it is nothing but poverty and despair. It's almost insulting. It's insulting. That's what it is. It's insulting to me. And so, I, step up to the plate, be partners with us, real partners, real partners with us, and then I'm here to help you. But at this point, it, we're not partners. It's all, it's just been one way street with the teams. And, it, and it just, it, it's infuriating to me, and I will tell you it's infuriating to our citizens because they can't even afford to go to the games. And we all know it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Kevin Bishop. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, uh, I, 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 pardon, excuse me, I, 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 got, I might have to ask a couple of redundant questions. Uh, Councilman Jones was asking me a question over here while you was explaining this to Councilman Palencic, and I didn't quite, quite get everything that I wanted to get uh, out of that. First, uh, to the assistant director, uh, who set the price for the garage, parking garage? Who set that price? From the... Okay. Uh, Ken? Yeah, for the chair. Through, through, through the chairman, the councilman, through the chairman, the councilman, Bishop, uh, I propose that price. Do you propose that price? Yes, sir. Have you ever, are you a certified appraiser, Mr. Silton? No, but I was a real estate lawyer in the law department. I operated my own practice, real estate practice for four years. I dealt very, very significantly with appraisals. Okay, so I heard you 
Uh, through the chair, I heard you mention um, about the parcel that Councilman Jones had asked about, and you gave uh, uh, a county valuation. Now, county valuations and market um, prices uh, differ quite a bit. Am I right or wrong? Through the, through the chair to uh, Councilman Bishop, I, I did not... Uh, you're referring, I think, to county valuations. Which, and I was, which, the figure that you, that you said it was a county valuation. No, you said the no county sir, had it I did not. Okay. Uh, we need to distinguish county valuations, which tend to be low, you're correct, from what the county website shows as the estimated value of the parcel. I reference the latter. The, if you were look, to look up this parcel on the county uh, website, you would see a lower value than two million. But if you look under the um, estimated value of the property, that's the number that I picked, which was one million nine hundred ninety-five thousand. Okay, so in true actuality. Market value, we are, we are not, these prices are not market value, is what you're saying. Through the chair to county. A fair market position. value is when I say fair market value, not county estimated value. No, no, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, I believe the 1995 number is a fair market value number. It is higher than the valuation that the county places on the parcel, which tend to be historically low. Okay. But the 1995 I believe to be a fair and accurate fair market value of the parcel. In any okay. event, the, the parcel is owned by Gateway, not by the city, and Gateway's board will have to approve it as a fair market value transaction. If, it, if, if, if my board members uh, an executive director do not agree that that number is correct, then we will have to revisit this. But I'm confident, give, given the county value and my no, own knowledge of comparables, that that number is reasonably accurate. Okay. All right, Mr. Chairman, through the, um, through the chair to the assistant director, uh, if you can when we sell, when the city sells a property, do the city set the price or do we let outside uh, outside entities set the price to our city city owned facilities? Yeah, from the chair to the to the councilman, I mean, we'll set the city sets the price for the garage, for, I mean for the sale of the property. So in this case, uh, through the chair, in this case, the city didn't set the price. It was Gateway to set the price. Director. Yeah, yeah. For the from the chair that for to the chair of the council person. I mean, the, we set the price for two million for the piece of property. I couldn't understand that. Sorry, could you repeat oh, that? Yeah, I'm sorry. So the chair to the council person. Is, are we talking about the the piece of property? The, the for the garage. For the garage itself. I mean, to the chair to the councilman. I mean. We, I mean, can can help set the price, but the city also looked at it as well. And, you know, we believe it's the fair market value of the garage. The team thinks it's actually lower. They, they have reports that it's lower. That's why they haven't agreed to buy it. But the city believes it's worth $25 million. And that's and that's the price, you know, that we have uh, agreed offered. Upon. So we, you say it's the price that we offered? From the, from the I'm, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to figure out that the city have have a role in setting the price for one of the city facilities. From, from the chair to the council person, yes, we did. From, but, from the, so, Mr. Silman's co uh, comment just a minute ago when he said he set the price, w was that correct or was that incorrect? The chair of the councilman, I mean, Mr. Silliman helps set the price, but he can't unilaterally set it. He, he works for Gateway. It's a city-owned facility. So the city, in conjunction with Mr. Silliman, looked at it, and we decided that $25 million was a fair price for the garage. And to date, you know, the, the garage is 20-plus years old. 
um, and we thought that was correct. Again, the, the Cleveland Guardians don't believe it's worth that much. They have studies that say it's worth less. We believe it's worth the $25 million. To, to the chair, to Councilman Bishop, I would add that per the same information that Councilman Palenza quoted, the city built the garage for $21 million back in, nine, in the early 1990s. And um, uh, the $25 million price is the price that I recommended and discussed with city uh, officials. I will add that the, that the team hit, did hire an appraiser, and that appraiser valued the garage at $18 million. And so it has been a subject of continued negotiation between Gateway, the city, and the team. So the, through, through the chair, the team had an appraiser set it at $18 million. I just want to understand this for clarification in, in my mind. Through the chair to Councilman Bishop, that's correct. Okay, so, but the, the stadium, the parking garage was built in 94, correct? Through the chair to Councilman Bishop, it, it was dedicated in 1994. Okay, so our, so has Gateway as a complex since 1994, is it more valuable today's dollars in 2021 or was it val more valuable in 1994, just for comparison in my mind, just for comparison? Through, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, you're now getting into uh, appraiser type uh, calculations. An appraiser is going to look at an asset like the garage and they're going to value it one of three ways, either market data, which is what it would sell today based on income, of, based on you know comparable sales there's the income valuation which looks at what its income is versus what its expenses are and then there's the cost method which looks at what it costs when it was placed in service and then takes into a, account a depreciation schedule over time a, an appraiser will will try to look at all three approaches and combine them and arrive at a value. That's what the team's appraiser did when they reached the valuation of 18 million. Now, we, myself, and the city officials differ with that appraiser and feel that there were factors that needed to be, and we presented some data to the team, and it was a continuing subject of negotiation. I hope that answers your question. So, well, so basically, we lost um, we lost a considerable amount of value that since the since the since the garage was built. Uh, if we if the city sells it for twenty five million, we would we would really we would really be selling at a loss, like Councilman Palencic said. Is that through, through the through the chair, the the city built the garage for a price of $21 million. Now, the city financed that construction, and by financing, incurred interest costs, which is how Councilman Palenza gets to the $89 million. But in terms of the value of the asset, when it was placed into service in 1994, that value was $21 million. So mm -hmm. the price that we're suggesting is actually $4 million higher than that, notwithstanding that the garage has undergone uh, 27 years of wear and tear. Okay, um, so through the chair to uh, Mr. Silman, uh, or to the assistant director, Gateway owns, uh, Gateway owns and, and will continue to own the baseball park, the baseball stadium. But we are proposing, or in this deal, we want to sell off pieces of, of the of the gateway complex, so the garage, uh, to the to the team. Is that is that where we headed? I mean, I, I'm not. A, can you explain that? To, through the chair, to Councilman Bishop, you are correct. Gateway owns the the footprint on which the ballpark exists, 
Gateway owns the ballpark itself and, and leased the ballpark to the team for a long-term lease that expires in 2023. Um, the Gateway East Garage is part of the Gateway operation, but the garage is owned by the city of Cleveland. Um, and yes, as part of this proposal to you, uh, we are proposing that the team be given an option to purchase the garage from the city for a two-year window for a purchase price of $25 million. Okay, through the chair to, um, to Mr. Silman. The construction that will take place uh, with the help of the county and the city funds that the county and the city funds, uh, the county and the city put up for the ballpark renovations, they will take place over time, correct? Through the chair to councilman, yes. Now, who actually controls that construction? Will it be Gateway or will it be the team? Through the chair to councilman Bishop, uh, Gateway as the owner has the ultimate responsibility uh, in past arrangements we've uh, arranged for the team to essentially be the construction manager subject to oversight and monitoring by Gateway staff. Okay, now why does Gateway give away? Now since we using we are using county dollars and city dollars that we pledge and um, and 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 and, and we're going to back up any shortfalls of any sources of dollars that we are uh, that, that we anticipate that we estimate, and we'll have to put up those dollars, the county and the city. But yet we actually give the team the rights to spend all of that money and control that money at their discretion and their disposal. Is that what you're saying? Uh, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that Gateway has the ultimate uh, control and responsibility as the owner of the ballpark. Um, it has, with both the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse and the uh, ballpark in past major construction projects, worked with the team and the team's construction manager, but the ultimate responsibility and control is lodged with Gateway. Okay. So going back to, through the chair, going back to Councilman Conwell's point about uh, inclusion when it comes to um, work being done at the ballpark and at the stadium, uh, and how um, certain um, facets of society has been left out of uh, these deals, what what is the what is the strategy of, um, of 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 the gateway to ensure that as a city when the city and county dollars are being used that it's equitable or, uh, uh, and it's spread around the table? Do you have any plans on or or, or or things in place to make sure that we are are, are fair when it comes to this construction cost? Through the chair to Councilman Bishop. As a bedrock, as a minimum, there is the gateway resolution adopting the community benefits agreement that was promulgated by Mayor Jackson back in 2013. That's the bedrock, that's the foundation. Having said that, however, that we, we at Gateway view that as a bare minimum. Uh, we look to projects like the Q transformation as exemplary in terms of going forward and achieving goals that much exceed the 2013 Community Benefits Agreement. To that end, we, uh, uh, myself and Gateway staff, have had several conversations with the Cuyahoga County Advisory Committee on Equity uh, and have discussed ways and means, both by Gateway and by the Guardians, to uh, enhance what we already have in place in the way of the bedrock community 
uh, benefits agreement. We have talked, uh, as Councilman Conwell yeah, raised, about not just <clears throat> construction procurement, but we've talked and the team has talked with the county committee on ongoing day-to-day -day operation procurement, things that are, may, may be completely unrelated to this construction project. And so we are talking about considerable enhancements above and beyond the 2013 okay. agreement. Great. Councilman? Okay. And we're we're um, getting close to time, but please continue. Okay, I got a couple questions. Um, okay, um, through the through the chair to Mr. Silman. So the sources of uh, from the uh, from this presentation, the sources of funds, all of these funds from the city, uh, with the sports facility reserve, the parking garage uh, revenue, all the way down the line to unspecified, which is the naming rights for the garage. All of these. Um, categories, whether it be fixed or variable, if any of those dollar amounts fall short, it would be on the city to pony up the rest of the money. Is that correct? Am I understanding that correct? Through the, through the chair to Councilman Bishop, I need to take the, the sources one by one to answer your question. Please do and, it as efficiently as you can, if you can. Yeah. Okay. As to the sports facility reserve, that is fixed. That's not variable. It's already in existence. There's nothing further the city okay. needs to do. Next. Uh, as to the admission tax, that is variable, but there is risk to the team as well as to the city. Uh, if, if the admission tax come in high, the team gets more than 2.6. If they come in low, the team gets less than that. And the garages, uh, as I've indicated, our term sheet provides that if the garage uh, revenues and the naming rights fall short of 2.3, Three million, then this city would make up the difference. Okay, all right. Uh, one more question uh, mm -hmm. to through the chair to Mr. Silman. Um, the terms, the lease term that we are are, are entering into with the, with the team. Um, can can you give me some perspective on historical lease terms that we have signed with the Indians going back? I mean, even even when they when they were at the old stadium, if you can. But is it typical that we sign a 15-year lease? Have we signed 15-year leases with the team uh, historically, or, or or is this a short lease? Can you can you through comment the, on that? Through the chair to Councilman Bishop, I think uh, Mr. Zendarsik would be better able to give the history of um, lease extensions, um, Joe. Well, with respect to our team, or I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, would, I would be yes. a, I would be more interested in the Indians or yes. the the past uh, because the Indians has been in Cleveland for quite a quite a long time, correct? Yes, yes and I'm I'm sorry, I I been with the team for 21 years, but I don't know the entire history of all our leases and and going back to Municipal Stadium and the like. I, so can't now, answer that. through the chair, the original lease when we when we signed when we built Gateway, the the when we entered into that, the, the team entered into the deal with Gateway back when the Gateway was being put up. Right. What term was that uh, lease? That was a thirty-year term. That was a thirty-year term. So it's safe to say that this term is is unusual. Um, yes and no, if you permit me. The the. In initial construction, brand new facility, 30-year term is not that unusual. In a midlife refresh, recycle, renovation type arrangement, it is not unusual at all. And if I just use the example of the Cavs, uh, that was only a seven-year extension with eight years remaining to a total number of years of 15. So the entire rocket mortgage model was awful close to what you see here. All right, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Kevin Conwell? Yeah, I just want to make a quick statement. Please. Real quick. Please. Uh, to, uh, the almost longest standing council member on Cleveland City Council, Mike <laughs> Palencic. The almost. <laughs> sure thing. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. 
No, let's <laughs> let's if we could stay on if we could stay on topic. Yeah, I would stay on topic. I let's keep going. Let's them. keep going. Let's keep the meeting going, please. You know, uh, Mr. President, when it took me some time to um, vote on this, I knew um, I was just reflecting, really, like what uh, Councilmember Mike Polensic was um, was uh, was was narrating about the poverty and the issue just in our wards that we're dealing with, and we're, we are the, the poorest city in America, and we've been the poorest city for a long time. So when you called the vote, I was just reflecting over all of that, the same thing that Mike Polinsky narrated. So I heard, but I don't want, and it's a statement, this is so important to me, I see, and what Councilmember Mike Polinsky said is right, I see the poverty that's in my ward, I see um, abject poverty, this in my ward. I see children going to school just to get a meal. Just to get a meal. Mm -hmm. I see that in my neighborhood. And then we push for the 120 for this uh, uh, for 120 million plus dollars for the for the uh, for, for the Indians for the Guardians. I like to say the Guardians. Mm -hmm. That's what they name um, changed it. But I understand the nine million dollars that's going into the general fund. I understand the circular economy of how. Hotels are built around it. I was there when uh, it was a desert. And then now we have Gateway, and now people are restaurants, and people are, are working, and they're taking care of their families. I understand. I get all of that. I just don't want, this is a statement. And when it took me a while to vote, I knew what was going on. I've been here for over 20 years. But I'm, as Fannie Lou Hammer would say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we don't benefit. We don't benefit. Now, um, Council President-elect told me when I voted, he said that he already talked with black-owned black trades. It's important that the people, I got 10 people working, 10 people for the Indians in my neighborhood. All right, but I'm looking at the whole city. It's important that I see African-American families working and that's how you keep families together and fathers are there and they're taking care of their children. Those things, it means a lot to me. That's why it took me, I was sitting by thinking. I've been at this table, matter of fact, Miss Lewis said this. Miss Lewis, your predecessor, $43 million went through a project and she said it's not even benefiting the people in the city of Cleveland. That was from the late Fannie Lewis. I was sitting right next to her and she said that. And that's why it took me a while to sit back and vote. I mean, I heard what was going on, but thinking about my residents flashing and seeing infant mortality that's in, the, that's in my ward and all of these things, and we're voting for this. And that's what was going on with me. So it hurt me. So you mentioned to me, Council President-elect, and you told me that he talked with Norman that was already and the Black on Black Trade Council mm -hmm. is gonna be there. I don't wanna wait until after we vote on a project and the next thing I know, they're out there protesting. Man. And we can't put people to work. Because we always come out on the short end of the stick. You know what I'm talking about, Council Member Barsha Jones. We always <coughs> come out on the short end of the stick. And that's why. And so I wanted to explain to everyone, I heard. But I need to see us working. And that's where I'm at. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Councilman. We appreciate your comments. Councilman Casey and then uh, Councilman Griffin to wrap up. Thank you, Mr. President. You. Um, Mr. President, to um, whomever can answer the question, of the 463 seasonals, does that include the Minutemen that come in every night and clean the stadium or the concessions, which is usually um, a separate entity or, or a different contract? does not include it does not include those. Minutemen. It does include our concession. concessions. Delaware North is in that Okay. Number. So the 463 includes the con the seasonal concessions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and I understand the, you know, if by they weren't here, you know, type um, of situation. Um, but the Bottom line, basically, is that the city makes one million dollars, basically, by by your own admissions, by um, having the Indians in town, and a lot of what we hear 
the revenue that comes through via whatever um, is usually not through the Indians themselves, but they're just the pass through by being here. So my one question is, is do they or how much has, um, do, they, do they pay an income tax to the city of Cleveland from the net profits of the Guardian's corporate organization? Can somebody answer that question? And if, not, if you have to get through, back. Through the, through the chair to Councilman Casey, the Indians contracted with Cleveland State University for an economic study. And as part of that study, we agreed that they would specify exact tax amounts that are paid. Now, those of you who've been on council for a while know that income taxes are, are very confidential as far as a record, but this was authorized by the team. So over a five-year average, their average income tax paid to the city was three million on an annual basis. That's part of the nine million that I speak of. So that's not in addition to that's that that's, that's part the, of that's the nine the, million. Okay, so so again, we're. I was just trying, hopefully, to look for but, additional but, dollars that the team was bringing in. But, but actually, through the chair to Councilman Casey, and the, the team will correct me if I'm wrong, that $3 million doesn't include the income tax paid by their, their principal concessionaire, Delaware North. Correct. Am I correct in that regard? Uh, through the chair to Councilman Casey, okay. that's correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and um, those, those are yeah, some this, fairly significant right. numbers yep. as well. So, um, and since you, uh, Mr. Chairman, through to, to Chief Silliman, when you kind of wanted to bring up reality a little earlier about um, talking about different stadiums and, you know, I think the unwritten innuendo here is that if we don't pass this, that the Indians will leave town, right? I, I, nobody has said that, yep. but that appears to be an unwritten innuendo um, going forward. But well, hang on, but here's, here's what we have to look at. Okay, since, since we're going to, I won't innuendo it, I will just be blunt with it, Mr. Chairman to, to Chief Silliman. We have an owner that when you look him up is worth $4.6 billion. Okay, we live in one of the poorest cities, and I hate to say that, in the country. I understand that a lot of the revenue that comes through the team uh, or through the gates are, are paid for by individuals who are attending the game, which we're not so sure are necessarily the majority of Clevelanders. And thank God that we have the surrounding area that supports the team, right? Um, but when you want to take $8 million of public city funds out of the city of Cleveland and give it to a billionaire owner who, oh, by the way, as a fan, doesn't necessarily reinvest in the team to put a good product on the field that keeps us as interested as we could, that's a hard pill to swallow because that's what we hear in the neighborhoods. That was, that, that was me. No, that was you. I'm, I won't take 10 minutes. That's a hard pill to swallow for us because that's what we hear, right? Because none of us live in, in the world of any major league sports owner's world, right? We can't comprehend that. And great for, great for that world, right? But when you're asking a whole other world to support that, um, and our real basic benefit to the city is one million dollars, right? And oh, by the way, now the team wants to take something that could be a possible sure. revenue generator for us. It's a very hard pill to swallow when you're on this tie, this side of of the glass. And I don't think anybody here doesn't love the Indians. Nobody loves them as much as I do. Can we? We sat at games together, and we, you know. And I wouldn't say, well, then go, right? But a lot of people that we, t well, that we hear from, and uh, granted, it's our votes. We have the 17 votes over here that we have to represent the whole city. But when we have a city that's saying to us, why are we supporting 
and I just won't even use the owner of the Indians, why are, why are we publicly supporting billionaire owners? Can somebody, maybe in the Indians organization or the chief, can somebody please help us out with that answer that we need to come up with to our residents? To the chair, to, to the extent, I don't really think we're going to answer that question, but to the extent, well, I, I mean, something, yeah. I, through, something to say. Through, I mean. through, the, through the chair, I'm going to start. Part of it needs to come from the team, but I'm going to start. I, I first want to address your team relocation issue, um, and when you've been doing these kind of deals as long as I have, and I started in 1992 with Gateway. And I went through the Save the Browns. I went through the Haslam's 120 million. Um, I went through the Q deal. And I've made it my business to follow deals around the country. There are certain warning signs you take from what, what, where you are in a timeline. And w when you reach less than three years remaining on a lease, that's a fire alarm. Um, and all kinds of possibilities open up the longer you go towards that expiration date. Now, I want to be crystal clear here that neither the owner nor the team representatives ever, in the two years we were at the table, mentioned other cities, threatened relocation, said that if you don't pay this amount, then we won't renew the lease. They don't do that. And I will add that back in 2014 and 2015, this team never got enough credit for voluntarily investing 40 million of their own monies in a complete <coughs> upgrade of Progressive Field, which was ready in time for the World Series, which enabled the city to get the All-Star Game. And nobody in the media picked up that here was a team owner voluntarily investing $40 million in the ballpark uh, when they could have come to the public and asked for participation. Now they're at a point where the lease is ready to expire, the facility is 27 years old, and they want to uh, enhance the existing building. They never asked for something new like other teams in other cities did. When you're on the public sector, even though no team, nobody ever even hinted at, at, at relocation, and when you, like me, lived through the Browns relocating on our watch, Mayor White, myself, uh, you have to take these things in consideration whether they bring them up or not. So I want to be very clear that the team has never employed that tactic with us. But if you look at what's happening nationally, you have to consider that as a factor. Now, as far as I'm well aware, Councilman, what you're hearing in your ward and what your colleagues are hearing in your ward, um, the, the Indians, when they speak, can speak to a, a recent family-friendly ticket package they've made available that does make a very affordable package. And I, I venture to say that those of you with lots of se senior citizens in your ward, and I'm looking your way, Councilman Polonczyk, Let's ask keep, them what they're doing at 7 p.m. on spring and summer evenings, and that is a major quality of life thing. I'll turn it back okay, to this, the team. To all right, right. I, I, we're, 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 yeah, we're not going to have to do that, but I just, just, just uh, yeah, that's, that's all right. Okay, I mean, that, that's just way. something that I felt needed to be said yeah. with, yeah. you know, yeah. with, yeah. because we hear it across the country. I just have one other question, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Please, one more question. Um, since you studied it so bad, Exclude the Las Vegas Raiders, okay, because they've been jumping from city to city forever. Have, do, do you, to the best of your knowledge, has any professional sports team, and I'm not just talking baseball, um, ever been told by a city, no, we're not going to finance you, and then that sports team relocated somewhere else? Atlanta Braves. Yes, Houston, okay. uh, the Houston Oilers in 1990. Uh, five, uh, the mayor of the city of Houston said, we want you to stay, but we can't afford your price tag. The Houston Oilers relocated to Nashville. 
Okay. The, uh, didn't the Atlanta and Braves as well move out of Atlanta to Cobb County? Cobb County. Well, that's that. I mean, that's still within. What's well, in the Atlanta? Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the Oilers the are the only are ones that you that you can remember. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman and Blaine San Griffin. Diego, thank you, Councilman Diego Blaine Griffin. Can, um, to the chair, can I just add one piece of context? Do I have uh, 30 yeah, seconds yeah, to add yeah, one thing? 25, 20. 20 seconds. Okay, quickly. <laughs> On the ticketing side, we've had a lot of. Um, very low price tickets for a long time. I think it's worth mentioning. We've had a $15 ticket for many, many years that comes with $4 of loaded value. I think that gets passed over. We just introduced a family-friendly ticket for people for $80 with $40 worth of loaded value. It's essentially $10 a ticket. So that's new for this year as well. And then just for the record, for specifics on, I think you mentioned, Councilman Casey, the $1 million. Ten more. $9 million a year in city taxes. $108 million in direct spending, $215 million by spending by visitors, and 5,000 jobs. Thank Those you. are all Thank real you very much, numbers. Councilman Blaine Griffin. Just a couple of things, and then we could just go ahead and call the vote, Mr. Chair. Um, we got a 2016, uh, you bought a new scoreboard, and I know that uh, those scoreboards usually last about, probably about 15 years. How do we make sure that we won't need another kind of major improvement like the scoreboard or other things before the term of this 15-year-old uh, lease. Uh, through, through the chair to Councilman Griffin, uh, the Gateway Board <laughs> collaborated with uh, Osborne Engineering and the team to develop a Gateway Facilities Assessment. This. This is similar to what we did when we were doing the Brown Stadium deal back in 2014, where you look at a projection of capital repairs over the next 10 or 15 years. That's what Gateway did. And you will see in that assessment in the year 2028, I believe, that there's a major line item for a new scoreboard. So it is in our projections. Uh, there's not likely to be a major surprise like that because our consultant looked at every aspect of the ballpark and what would be coming due when. So when Mike Polinsic is here to vote in 2028, <laughs> we won't have to pay for another scoreboard. Through the chair to Councilman Griffin, uh, if, if this council does this uh, agreement, then the funding that we have in this agreement will pay for that scoreboard in 2028. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other thing, and then um, just, just a couple of small questions. $25 million, um, is the cost that we're proposing for the garage, and you said it's going to go into an annuity. How much would that annuity yield us every year in uh, residual income uh, out of that $25 million? Through the chair uh, to Councilman Griffin, uh, if you assume, I believe, a 2% interest rate, that $25 million should yield uh, right around $2 million a year for the 15 years. So even if we did sell this, we would still probably recoup our $2 million that we currently are getting in revenue now based on the $25 million that we would sell it for that would go into an annuity and yield $2 million a year. Did I state uh, that correctly? Uh, Yet through the chair to Councilman Griffin, in my judgment, yes. Uh, Mr. Gentile may want to weigh in. Yes, uh, to the chair to the Councilman, the annuity will yield those results. So the revenues that were subject to the uh, re parking revenue, the annuity will make that payment instead of us making it. Okay, and that's important to know. That will go to our general fund, that, would, that, that money that would be generated through that annuity. To, to the trailer council, no, it would be it would be the two, instead of us using the I mean the parking revenue we wouldn't own the garage, so the two million that we would get from the annuity would be what you know we would pay as part of this deal. Oh, so that two million would actually go towards part of paying that uh, eight million that we're actually right to the trailer the council. Yeah. Yes. Okay, to the chair um, council, Griffin. I think the major difference is, is that it would be fixed. And all likely versus variable because we would know what that purchase price would be and come back in the annuity versus mm -hmm. the variability of the parking versus revenue. Versus being variable. Yep. Okay, thank you. Last but not least, and I'll turn it over, lawsuit by the players. We know that that one was pending. Is that still pending for the visiting players that were trying not to pay taxes uh, in the city that they're playing in? And if, that is, if, they, if they were happen to win that lawsuit, how would that impact this deal? Because that would be less income tax that we would be generating based on that lawsuit that they have. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't give you... 
any particular update on the status of that. Uh, and I think we're all sort of curious as to where it might go. Well, I'm more so concerned that the projections that we have are based upon those income taxes that are being paid by those players. So yeah. we may be in a position, if they win this lawsuit, that those revenues may be less. It, it's possible. Uh, I, I think the better argument there is they do come here to work. Okay. And, and I believe they should pay taxes. They are a transient worker everything. working but in But we don't in know what city. judge may be on this web. But last but not least, and I promise the council president we can move on, um, labor. I know that, um, you know, the, the unions, the, the small guys, they may try to organize. They may try to have already a union in your place. Do you guys have any of the labor unions that represent your place? And if they were to do a card check, would that be something that you guys would um, – Oppose or something that you guys would have an issue with or anything else? Just curious about how you approach those issues. Um, through the chair to Councilman Griffin, we do have a couple of unions. Um, we have a, a union that represents our um, custodial staff. We've got a union that represents our uh, ushers and ticket taters. We have a union that represents our sound engineer and stagehands if we have concerts. And we have a union in our, with our box office employees. All of those are collectively bargained on a, on a regular basis. And the players' union. An employer's union, yep. It would be good to know all of those, but that's great. That's great okay. to know just to yep. see that you guys are not into trying to stop those things. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. I just want to remind all my colleagues that this is our asset. Um, I know that my good friend from Ward 1 is the best negotiator in Cleveland. Um, I just hope that we do get the best uh, deal that this city could, uh, could have. But at the end of the day, this is our asset. And a lot of these decisions were made 30, 40 years ago. And we're a council now that's trying to make sure that we get the best thing for our city. And uh, in direct spending and all those things that uh, Neil said, I want us to keep that in mind that 25 years ago when we walked that district, it was nothing like it looks now. And it generates a lot of money for our city. So keep that in mind as we have this discussion. And I did have a conversation with the black contractors, and they are very much in support of this based on their um, assumption of being a part of the community agreements benefit, and we will be watching that closely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Griffin was the last on the list. Mr. Chairman, I asked to be, be put on the list. I've waited here patiently. I thought you had concluded. Um, no, I was, Okay. Council, listen, please listen. I um, asked to be put back on the list. Councilman, if you'll please listen. I'm the chair. Okay, yes, and we're running a committee right here. Um, what I'd like to do, we're, we're going to lose quorum. I want to take a vote, then I'll then we'll listen, and then we'll then we'll adjourn. And I just want people to know procedurally, um, this will be for second reading tonight, third reading next Monday. So it's second reading tonight, just so everybody understands so, the procedure. So, Mr. Chairman, for clarification, Councilman, you're saying right now that you're going to pass the piece of legislation currently. And you will allow me to have opportunity to, to ask the that. questions. Yes, before that we to, adjourn. Before we adjourn. Yes. Okay. So it so is. If it there is, so it is the, the the chair wants to move this out, pass it right away, and get it out into into the atmosphere for a final, uh, for the second. Was this the third reading or the second? This, reading? Okay. Tonight will be second reading. Third reading will be next Monday. Okay. Other than Councilman Jones, is there anybody else who has questions on ordinance number 844-2021? Hearing none, ordinance number 844-2021 stands approved. If you could stay here for a minute for, for Councilman Jones, please sign. Appreciate it again. Second reading tonight and third reading next, will be scheduled for next week. Councilman Jones? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, certainly the, your, it's your prerogative to push it through, um, but there's a lot of questions that have not uh, been asked and certainly there's no answers to those questions and I'd like to to ask some of those questions now uh, Mr. Chairman and Councilman, I I am gonna, just so just so we're, just, Councilman, just so I'm going to ask those questions Councilman I am the chair and I'm asking you to please listen um, in you've had the first but I'm going to have to limit you to six minutes at, for in this in this tranche of questioning um, so that we can continue and, and move forward. So, but please continue. Well, Mr. Chairman, when you say you're limited to me in six minutes after the session is over with. No, I'm limiting you to six it. minutes now. If you'd please start because you already had your first set of questions and we, we people need to get ready for the seven o'clock meeting, but please continue. Well, Mr. Chairman, can I still ask the committee questions? They can, they can leave. I can still ask this. Floor. You have, you have until 550. You have until 550. I see. 
So, so Mr. Chairman, um, you know, certainly it is your prerogative. I hope that the new president doesn't be the same way and act the same way you're acting. That'll right be now. that'll be a because his prerogative. But this is not the way the council deliberates just you know, on a professional level. And so, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Mr. Silliman, uh, the initial question that I had asked you was about the memorandum of understanding. And that's really important because it, it seems like that's all we have here to really bargain with. Um, and so I asked the question before earlier, and I know that the council deliberated for quite some time about the memoranda of, of understanding. We've had one in the past, and what I was asking you, because you're very professional, you've been through this as you had stated earlier, what was some of those outcomes of the past memorandum of understanding? And then to the team, what's really important to us is making sure that we do have that kind of gateway of relationship with the team. Uh, you, you talked about a lot of the things that you've expressed in some of your documentation. I've had an opportunity to look at that. But what I would like to see is how did and how was minority participation uh, in the past, uh, in addition to what kind of community benefits uh, existed and what you did during the tenure that you've been in charge. Um, you talked about uh, in your presentation that you've contributed to the city of Cleveland since 1994. I know that you have not had the ownership since that period of time, so it would be nice to know from that point of time when you obtained ownership what was some of those commitments to the neighborhood and the community to the citizens of the city of Cleveland? And if we could make that documentation available, uh, that would be very important. And then also, Mr. Chairman, since we've had these sessions, I would like to know more about the gateway structure uh, as institution, how it's organized, its membership. Uh, also, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have an annual budget of, of what the Gateway organization is all about, its mission statement, and all of the above. Uh, I will look more deeply into this because we don't, and this council hasn't been given the complete opportunity, totally, all of its members to deliberate this. Uh, again, which, you know, you know, this is the prerogative of the leadership uh, of the council. So, but at this time, the citizens of the city of Cleveland have questions. So, the question I would start out with is a financial question. Uh, when you take the amount that the county will be giving, the city will also be participating and giving on the annual basis on this deal, and all the major players, what is that total within the term of 15 years? Through, through the chair to Councilman Jones, 19 million a year total from the public sector, which multiplied by 15 years equals 285 million. So the, the city would would pay 285 million. No, no, the public sector would pay 285 million. The city would pay 8 million a year over 15 years, which is 120 million. Right, so then there would be 135 million from the county? Uh, through the chair to councilman, uh, it would be 2 million a year from the state of Ohio, or 30 million, and the rest from the county. Okay, can I? Break, can you break this down? Because I want to make sure I get the totals here. It's so nine the, mil the it's county government, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Silliman, is paying the $9 million, is that correct? Yes. Over a course of 15 years, is yes. that correct? And what is that total? Uh, $135 million. And that's correct. So now the city will be paying how much a year? Uh, $8 million a year for 15 years or $120 million. And then the state would be paying $2 million a year? Th yes. So then that comes to $15 million? No, that comes to $30 million. Okay. And then that total is $285 million. Through the chair to Councilman Jones, yes. Okay. So the, the, the city, the citizens of the, of the state, the, the county, and the city of Cleveland will be paying a total of $285 million for 15 years. Is that correct? Yes. And of that $285 million that that they will be paying in, two, in, in uh, 15 years. How much is the Cleveland Indians contributing uh, for that, that period of time of 15 years? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, they are contributing uh, a little over 10 million a year, of which four and a half million goes to ballpark improvements, about uh, three and a half million goes, or so, about. So what is the total, Mr. Chairman, not the breakdown, what is the total over the course of 15 years they'll be paying? Um, just doing quick math in my head, and I stand corrected by the Indians representatives, somewhere around uh, 150 to 160 million. 
And, and Mr. Chairman, um, and there, but we don't have, do, do we have a breakdown on how those funds will be actually spent? I saw a generality sheet, yes. but it didn't give me any details. No, through the chair to Councilman Jones, you have a very detailed allocation on the term sheet, page two, the table on page two indicates where the contributions are coming from, and the table on page three in indicates the, what the team's paying for in a breakdown of that 10 plus million and what the public's paying for in a breakdown of that 19 million. I see. And Mr. Chairman, here's another piece that was kind of uh, not clear uh, as we've been talking about this, and I know it hasn't, a lot of that has been talked about, is the amended and restated lease. You know, the language, how it's written out, what triggers it, because one of the things, Mr. President, I know this council rushed really quickly to put this on, and this administration rushed to do it before the close of the year. I think it, it hasn't done justice uh, to us to really fundamentally deliberate it, and we didn't have a law firm nor did we have council legal uh, engaged in this process. And if they were, they were not sitting at the table. So it really puts this council at a super disadvantage. And we've been at a disadvantage with Cleveland Public Power with, with going into agreements that have put that, that uh, that organization in a deficit right now. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm not saying that, that would be the case here, but what I'm saying is that we rushed this process a little bit too fast. Uh, this councilman uh, certainly uh, is not in agreement with it. However, I support uh, the Cleveland Indians. I just wanted to have a little bit more time where we could talk about how this lease kicks in and if we could have had a better deal, uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, the Indians and all of those who are listening. Because my colleague brought it up and it's because it's been an issue here we should have a 30-year deal. Coming back here in 15 years, not having the, the parking garage as a component in this process of renegotiations, and then not having that parcel of land puts us at a big disadvantage. And so in 15 years, Mr. Ch Mr. President, you, you're leaving this year. So, But in 15 years from now, there may be a whole different presidency in place. And the, the challenge is, what kind of deal do we look forward in just a mere 15 years, which is a sneeze from now? So Mr. Chairman, to the the Cleveland Indians, could we have done something close to a 30-year deal versus getting a 15-year deal? And that was one of the questions that I, I wanted to ask at this, this table. But Why such answer, a short term? And then if you could try to the, answer the question. What, what I was bottom. told just didn't fizzle out for me in terms of renewals uh, as it relates to the gateway. We think that that's going to happen anyway, regardless, because we want to keep our sports teams intact. And there's been a lot of but work that has been done to put that in place. Yeah. If you can try to answer, then, we'll have, then, we need to, then we need to adjourn the meeting. If you could do your best to answer the council's question. Yeah. Well, I would like it from the Cleveland Indians. I'd like to know. Why, why the 15-year deal? Why 15 years? I mean, were you looking to leave in 15 years? Why 15 years? Simplest problem was we couldn't match up additional <laughs> revenues beyond 2035 uh, it, 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 without any diff with any practical idea what they were going to be. It was hard enough to get as far as we got. Uh, we managed to get further out than the, the Cavs deal, like I mentioned earlier. And these midlife deals where you have to deal with the costs of the renovations of parks in addition to capital repairs, are difficult and not the same as new ballpark construction. And we deliberately stayed away from new ballpark construction because of the purchase price. And, and that's, the, that's the question. You couldn't get the deal extended out further. It, all I'm saying is that it's very difficult. If you could give me a 9 to 10 or 12 million dollar a year revenue stream that would go out 30 years, it would probably be an opportunity, wouldn't it? But there is no identifiable one right now. The existing, existing deal doesn't have any new taxes or revenue streams. They all exist. So we're not asking to create new taxes or new revenue streams. They all exist today. Great. If we go out past 15 years, we're going to have a different conversation on having to generate new taxes that don't exist today. It's a much more difficult conversation. Uh, these are all known sources today, right now. Uh, uh, less Chairman, com less who, comment than we're going to adjourn. Who, who, do, who do I speak to to talk about uh, memorandum of understanding and a little bit more about the nuances of the deal? Because, again, the, you know, some of the information that I have here, you know, it would take 
a little bit more time to ask some of those questions, and, and they were not a part of the portfolio. So who, who can I talk to here to, to talk about the memorandum of understanding, who can, who how can it's going to make a positive no. impact for the citizens of the city of Cleveland uh, in general, and in particular, how do we, we work in partnership uh, in our community for a deal we hope that will not only be a positive deal uh, for the Indians, but also a very positive deal uh, for our ward. Uh, okay, and so then finally, the Mr. President, and I close it out with making these comments. You know, I you know I certainly support um, you know the deal to some degree because I realize and I understand that you know this will help to support our neighborhoods and and to know that the revenue um, that you generate helps and I know that a, a greater portion of revenue from downtown helps to support our general fund and, um, Last comment, and please. we want to certainly support uh, the hotels and the restaurants and the spending and the investments that are being made downtown so I get the overall prospect of being supportive of the deal my only deal in this whole piece was why didn't we extend it out to uh, 30 years and then this council not really having any real time to deliberate this uh, process within just a short space of time handicap the citizens of the city of Cleveland and being able to really understand the deal. And I think that most Clevelanders and older Clevelanders who live in the city of Cleveland understand the significance and importance of making sure we have a strong, fundamental, functioning city. Hey. And I was here fighting back in those spaces of time when Mr. Silliman was uh, part of that negotiations and Mike White was the mayor of the city of Cleveland. In fact, I ran in 1993 for council for the very first time. Okay, so I'm very so familiar with those issues. Great. And so, Mr. President, you know, I appreciate you, know, you uh, giving me the extra time. Yeah, you've kind of and, taken it. And so let's thank you guys for being here. here. Thank everybody. Um, appreciate everybody's input. And again, second reading this is going to go for a uh, full three readings. So I appreciate everybody's time. This committee meeting is adjourned.